Right on. So yeah. what did you discuss with Howdy Makowski? He's, so, uh, yeah, he's a in interesting. I like the the subjects he covers. So I'm curious what uh, what he covered with you and what were your thoughts about it? Yeah, so I originally had, I had found Howdy on his on his first book, Exposing the World's Fairs, and he was on the Crow podcast. And I've had Crow on as well. Crow's awesome. And um, I had listened to Howdy talk about, you know, exposing the World's Fairs. And it's something I'd never thought about before is just how in depth he went into the World's Fairs. You learn about the World's Fairs in, in high school and stuff like that, but not to the extent of how Howdy explains it in his book. And, you know, I had reached out to Howdy to see if he'd come on the show. And he's, yeah, he's like, I'd be delighted to come on the show, Paul. So he had came on, I think about a year or two years ago with me, Johnny and Jesse. And we talked about the World's Fairs and he blew my mind. And, you know, I've just stayed in touch with him ever since. And he had recently came on, I think it was at the beginning of this year. And we talked about exiting Plato's Cave. It was actually yeah, in February. And, you know, we get into the Cathars, the Agnostics and the Demiurge and, you know, we kind of talk about the Matrix a little bit. And we had a viral clip on TikTok. It was just about how how he had explained how he thinks that there are only 100 million true souls that live on the Earth. And that's a pretty broad number. You know, it, it, no one really knows for sure. And he had suggested that potentially the rest of the people could be NPCs. So, you know, TikTok loved that and went crazy. And... I know that's a dangerous a dangerous concept, you know, saying other people are NPCs. But um, once that happened, how he kind of, you know, I think he did a separate video on explaining more in detail what he meant by that. Mm. And I couldn't do you justice on how he explained um, what he thinks NPCs are, but you just have to go back and listen to how how he explains it. And he actually came on about a month ago or two months ago, and we kind of, you know, talked about his third book that's coming out a little bit. And yeah, I just like to get uh, um, philosophical with Howdy because I think it's mm -hmm. very fascinating to go to go down that road because he has a lot of good uh, feedback and and material, you know, a lot of pondering and research on his side going into those types of topics. It's it's he's just, he's just got a great mind. Yeah, I hadn't heard that theory before. That's an interesting one. I've considered that as well. The idea of NPCs or spiritless beings or some some type of thing that doesn't seem to be going on in the heads of some people but then at the same time i you know worry and caution about the whole idea of trying to separate humanity into two or more divisions like that and what it the the kind of you know racism i guess you could call it that exists once you start doing that no matter what the division is so you, like uh david ike reptilians or something versus normal people now suddenly it's like, who's a reptilian and it's us versus them. Or even with psychopaths, if you, once you, once you divide humanity into two is, you know, are they really unable to be recovered? Is it truly a division in humanity that there's empathetic people and psychopaths people or sociopaths that just can't feel or like this? NPCs, spiritless people. Are there really some people that have true conscience and, you know, there's somebody really piloting at the helm, whereas other people are just kind of running this script and they're NPCs just going through their life being non-player characters. It, it's appealing to think that way and oftentimes it seems that way, though more often than not, I think rather than there being this black and white split that we often see, it's more on like a scale. And so maybe at the very top of the scale is someone who has so little empathy that we can classify them as a psychopath. And, um, you know, the most empathetic person being on the, the opposite end of the scale. But at no point maybe is there an actual dividing line where it's like, you're another thing from us. You're not one of us, you don't have a spirit you don't have empathy you are a reptilian what whatever the thing is you, you know you're a goy or whatever you're one of the chosen uh, or you're royal and the others are just subjects you know whatever the split might be in humanity like that uh really caution it and it seems like a failing you know unless unless it's true are, are there really so is there some split somewhere in humanity and there's these 
you know, secret evil people living amongst us that it's diff difficult to differentiate between us because we all look alike. You know, it's possible, I guess, but do we want to live in the world that everybody's operating that way? Um, so, you know, I always go back and forth about any time I hear something like this. A um, hundred million souls and everyone else doesn't have a soul. Okay. <laughs> then what, how do you live your life if you, if you um, either believe or even uh, um, go along with that philosophy for a while? I doubt that, um, you know, your life is going to be as fruitful as if you have more of a gray area philosophy, like I'm saying. That's yeah. like a black and white. I have this thing I call the light gray philosophy. <laughs> Or like people are often, I think it's in the human condition to divide things into easy groupings like, that are black and white like that. Okay, you have a soul, you're, you're cognizant, but this guy over here, he's a non-player character. He doesn't seem to change. He doesn't seem to understand things. So I'm going to believe that he's a inherently, intrinsically different thing than I am. Okay. It's slippery slope when you start thinking that way. Maybe he's not inherently, intrinsically, totally different to the point you have to reclassify him as a different type of human. Maybe we're all just on a sliding scale and we're all different and your your classifications are a bit too rigid if it gets into this black and white territory where it's us versus them um, thinking. Uh, I always wonder about that. Do you almost think it's by design at that point, though, that at least for what we can see in, in the Western culture is that they've kind of built it that way because, you know, the propaganda machine, um, what they're able to do and what they've done with education for the past hundred years, whatever they put in the food, whatever sprayed into the skies, whatever we watch on TV. It, it, and that's kind of where I was like heading and, and, and wondering and asking howdy is like we could think that these people are NPCs, but at the same time, maybe they're just more susceptible to all those things. And then they kind of just make their mind up uh, based upon being brainwashed or, or you know what I'm saying? Consuming mm -hmm. all that type of content, 1984 type stuff. Absolutely. I think that we're all in a sense, NPCs. We all have a script that is the inherent drive of humanity, the basic, the base psychology. And then throughout our lives, like a role playing game, we get little plus ones, plus twos to constitution, to intelligence, to strength, to, to all your little things. And so we do differentiate um, as we go. Um, and eventually, um, people that are very individualized, I would say they've reached on Maslow's pyramid of needs, the, the self actualization uh, mark. And if you're involved there so you've gotten past all your base survival emotional psychological needs and now you're into the kind of the spiritual self-actualization if you've gotten to that point and then you look back at people that are still at their base needs it might be easy to to call them npcs or something like this uh forgetting that you had to go through that whole stage of self-individualization and you weren't as self-actualized and realized as you you know, you may be on your high horse sitting there looking at someone else and calling them an NPC. Um, they just might be on a, a different, you know, tier of that track. Um, and so if that's the case, then we're all, you know, it's, it's like there's a drive of NPC-ness. In a video game, that's kind of how it is, right? The, the player character has to differentiate themselves from the non-player characters, the NPCs by actually having someone at the helm making intelligent decisions, changing their mind in reaction to the world as it's coming. And so the, the, the word NPC would be someone who's not doing that. And so all that really means maybe is they're a slow learner or they, you know, they haven't gotten up to speed yet. Or like you said, they may be more susceptible to propaganda or other kinds of subconscious streams of, of uh, influence that a self-actualized person would pass right by and, and see it for what it is and then wonder how you know but that, then then it brings it right back it's like so if you're so self-actualized and enlightened why can't you even recognize the fact that you're not some completely different thing than the other person you're condemning as an npc they're just 
another version of you that hasn't made it to the top of the mountain where you're sitting and you know all pretentious <laughs> right so did you see more people i guess and in, in, in thailand that were more aware or more spiritually aware as opposed to in the states or i guess i could ask were there less npcs in thailand i you know what i'm saying no i wouldn't say it's up to geography or genetics or anything like that it seems to be a pretty even split of the type of people you meet everywhere um so no i didn't feel like there was like this real split in in humanity uh there's cultural <clears throat> differences there's some things so kind of like um statistically speaking you might have more of this than that over there but um no, I didn't feel like I was generally amongst more self-actualized or more spiritual people. They they do have a wonderfully spiritual tradition and culture and history, um, but you could say that for Euro, you know Europeans, Westerners, and and everything. So anywhere really, um, uh, the whole world over has many rich cultures, traditions, and spiritualities. But now in 2023, how, how many modern day people are um really living that way or or what would the word be helping to maintain and that structure maybe not so much you know the way of the world people are more into social media and things like that than they are into heritage um history and spiritual traditions and that kind of thing so do you think that that's by design as well because i'll be honest eric like I'm 34 now and I'm, I'm finally starting. I, I've been on this road, you know, I told you I've been doing the podcast for five years. So I, I'm not on top of the mountain type of thing. Uh, I've been dealing with a lot of addiction and, 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 and that can mean anything like phone addiction, <clears throat> um, internet addiction, energy drinks addiction, smoking cigarettes addiction, um, just, you know, those types of things. And just recently, like the past month and a half, man, I, I, I don't know if you would call it spiritual, but, you know, life is hard you go through times and, and tribulations or whatever it is and the hard times that i'm going through have brought me away from those things away from those addictions and i know it's a small sample size to say i've only been doing it for a month and a half but i, I feel better you know I'm, I'm i'm maybe on my phone just for the podcast you know just to get things uploaded all those types of things but but just stepping away from addictions man in the western society has kind of brought me i guess closer to that to the top of the mountain that you described and i guess i guess my question is i went on a little bit of a rant is do you, i feel like that they put those things in front of us to keep us away from what we're truly meant to do you know because I, I think that i'd like to believe that there was a time on earth where people were more spiritually involved with each other community wise um just togetherness. I don't know if you would say during the pyramid times in Egypt when they built those, if, if that's what that was. I don't think any of us will really truly ever know. But I guess it's kind of like a two part question. Do you do you think addiction is is by design? All these small addictions that they offer us. And two, without those, do you think that without social media and all those types of things, do you think that we would be all more spiritual together? Mm. Um, the the certain drugs that government chooses to allow versus the ones that they choose to make illegal certainly by itself makes a case that they seem to be wanting us to be addicted to some of the worst things while disallowing for us to have some of the better remedies because a lot of um, psychedelics for instance like ibogaine or ayahuasca which are illegal in most places dmt uh, those have been known to break people from other addictions like alcohol and cigarettes and other things that are more harmful addictions. And these psychedelic plants aren't addictive. They're such intense uh, ex and long experiences that you don't <laughs> you don't have an ibogaine trip and then just be like, oh, now I'm addicted to it, man. I just I want to have iboga trips every single day, <laughs> like. There's, there's certain plants that don't have that same kind of addictive quality that something like a coca plant would have. And so you can you can literally like change plants, have a, a trip with this one plant and suddenly be like, 
that plant no longer holds any interest or um, hold over me and, and that people that have had lifelong addictions are released from it. Meanwhile, um, like I'm saying, uh, cigarettes and alcohol and certain things like that are totally legal, taxed and everything, but drugs like this that have been known to break people of these addictions are illegal. So that certainly can make you question, you know, what's the government's intent for behind this? Do they actually want us addicted? And, you know, the conspiracy theorist in you can keep going and it certainly makes sense why they would want you addicted to their taxed substances and their pharmaceuticals is their main one. That's the more so than cigarettes and um, alcohol or whatever is pharmaceuticals, especially in America. Coming back, that's one thing you notice coming back is just the advertisements all over the place. You know, talk to your doctor. Do you need Blapoclip with Snermatumin? It's like all these ridiculous names and these people with happy families on there and white clothing. <laughs> it's just silly. Um, but they don't, a lot of places, they don't allow you to advertise pharmaceuticals on television or in magazines or stuff like that. So again, it makes you wonder. It's like, okay, so who are they in bed with that this is fine to do this? Um, uh, and meanwhile, you also mentioned like social media. Are they trying, they're absolutely trying to addict us to social media because we've found um, that people that like Facebook and and other places, Instagram, it's the same place. Um, but these social media companies are driving their algorithms based on how much attention we give them. So their mean currency that they're operating in is not having us leave our phones or going to another website. So everything about it is trying to get you on Facebook, staying on Facebook, not going anywhere else, and just continuing to scroll. TikTok, I guess, was the best at this. Um, they just discovered the perfect algorithm for delivering humanity uh, dopamine in the, the right quantities and the right timeline, and then an algorithm that gives us tailored to us specifically what what we want so that we'll just keep on scrolling for attention and getting the kind of chemical release and emotional connection that we should be getting and used to be getting from actual relationships and going out and doing things with our life that now we can just you know woo, and, and we get all the same feels uh, similar to like a matrix thing where you're just sitting in a pod and all connected and you know you're having this whole life somewhere else um where people are starting to enact that more and more so right. <laughs> me, meanwhile we're getting these philosophies coming in like simulation theory and everybody thinking that all of reality is a simulation it's like well you're <laughs> it's like uh art imitates reality or reality imitates art we're getting in a self uh, enclosing loop of of simulations to the point that uh, yeah I don't, wh where's the original <laughs> right. how many simulations deep are we at this point <laughs> right I would I say you know depending on how you talk about reality if if there's a creator and we're creations it's already are, that's already a simulation we're not the real thing we we are part of something that's been created so it's already yeah that by definition to me is a simulation. But then there's a lot of other connotations, I think, that people are adding on to it nowadays with this simulation theory, whatever that means. It's like we're in a computer program or something. I don't know. It's a bit too far fetched when it gets to that point. But if you're just using it as a metaphor, <clears throat> as a metaphor, then I agree. I think it's a good one. I think that's the most curious thing for me is like being addicted to my phone for such a long time. And again, Eric, I'm, I'm no saint, man. I, I've stepped away from it. It's been you know close to two months now. And I'll be honest, man, it's almost profound to the to the to the point where like I pick it up and like I, I notice myself starting to want to scroll and like get on TikTok or get on YouTube and start searching videos, man. But I, I feel like it's it's weird, man. Now that I haven't done it for a little bit, I'm not gonna say such a long time, you know, compared to you know the past 18 years of my life, it's what I've been doing. Like I'm very disengaged in it. I'm very disinterested. I'm like, why am I doing this? Why do I even want to be on here? And then mm -hmm. like I, I find myself gazing more often, and 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 uh, and I'm in my own thoughts, and I'm thinking about things, and 
you know, my wife's like, well, you need an outlet. You need to do something. And I'm like, well, I just don't want to be on my phone. Like, it's it's pointless to me. I just don't. It's weird, man. Like, just not being on it for almost two months. What it's already, how my brain, I guess, has been rewired. And and I don't even know if that's really the case. It's just, I don't, I don't, I don't know how to explain it, man. Because like, whenever you get on Google and you look up phone addiction, like they've already had it tailored to where like it it's not necessarily a bad thing. You know what I'm saying? They're trying on, on Google of all places. And even on brave, I think I looked it up as well. Um, they try and make it not seem as bad as it, bad as it is. But I mean, at least there is information on there and, and it is something that exists. People are addicted to their phone. It is something that's tearing this country apart. You're right. We're not having these relationships and not talking to people in person. And, um, it's just a scary place to be in, man. And I don't know if that's like the next step of evolution, for, if that's what you want to call it for human beings, is to just, you know, the movie Wally. I don't know if you've that's seen that. I was that. just thinking about yeah. you saying that. <laughs> yeah, but that's, the, that's honestly where we're headed to, man. And that's a, that's a scary place to be at because what, what I've realized through the, these past two months is that I value like human to human interaction better. Like, I'd rather spend time with my family and with my wife as opposed to being on my phone and doing those things. And a lot of people out there, choose the latter man and they're doing the opposite and it's it's just that's just that's just the future man and that's scary right and it's it, it has to be a balance too though even with this it's um tempting to go black and white with it but really this technology of social media and skype that we're using here and youtube that people are going to be listening to us from it is an amazing technology and that's why everyone is so addicted to it it's new it just came to humanity you know we've been existing for thousands of years and not had this really cool way to communicate and store information so that now everybody can be so connected in this way and share information instantly we have never able to do this before the internet or you know before it was all the dinosaur media and everyone trying to, you really were a conspiracy theorist at that point because where could you even get some of this alternative information? With the advent of the internet, with direct peer-to-peer -peer communication and um, information exchange, actual data and evidence and, and proof for th certain things that has eluded humanity for so long is now coming to the surface and it's only able to do so because of these amazing technologies. And so it makes sense that we would be addicted to them and just enamored the way that we are with things like social media and the internet. Um, so I think it's like I'm saying with everything, we just have to find a balance point. We've just gone overboard with this new thing. We're all addicted to it. We're enamored with it. We just now are seeing that we need to step back from it because there's other parts of the human condition that aren't being tended to when we just completely engage in this aspect of it. And so, yeah, some of the things we need to get back to are actual face-to-face -face relations and doing things in the 3D physical world versus just on a black screen. <clears throat> because it's the more we do so, we're also finding that some other clever people <clears throat> at the top of society who were questioning who may have planned us to be addicted and driving our attention in such a way, they're seeing this time as an opportunity as well. While we're all distracted and enamored with this technology, they're using the technology and bringing more of it in to close a technological cage around us. While we're down here, you know, looking at it, there's a whole bunch of other technology right around us, making sure we're about not to be able to leave this room but all right, well, as long as this, as long as whatever I'm scrolling through is entertaining enough, I guess it'll be okay type of thing. So we absolutely need to look our heads up um, from all this digitization before they start getting rid of things like physical currencies that we need to operate in 3D society instead of them just enticing us and saying, no, here's your new digital wallet. We're gonna give you some new digital money for free because we really want to get everybody on the system and you're not going to do it otherwise. So keep scrolling and keep enjoying this technology while we create this technological slave grid around you. And that's the black part of this black and white dilemma we're faced with here is that, yeah, 
if we get too engaged in technology, it will be completely to our detriment. Um, but also if we try to disengage completely and act like, no, let's be Amish or something <laughs> like, let's not use electricity or any of the things that it can bring to humanity or our lives. Actually, I mean, the Amish have a lot going, not necessarily knocking them at all, but, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm just saying that technology has a gray area. There are certainly a lot of benefits to it, but if you go too deep into it, um, there's, there's, a um, evils that are being set up around us that we need to be wary of. And I, and I don't know if we'll ever really know the answer, but I'm kind of curious on how we progress to that type of technology so fast. And, you know, we're told that it was invented and it was a progression and, you know, these players were involved and these people were involved, but I don't know how much of that I actually believe. I haven't really done, done a lot of research into that, so I don't know if you can bring light to that at all. But do you almost feel like that that technology was placed here for a reason, or do you think it just naturally happened kind of thing? Good question. How did somebody, humanity, come up with telephones and televisions and cell phones and the internet and computers? Like, was it really, and video games? And the, the step from it just being a piece of metal <laughs> and, and some glass and, and how on earth did that get to where it was? I don't know if I'm just completely ignorant of the history of the evolution of technology, or if there truly is some gaps in how this happened. But to me, it's always just seemed like magic how we ever developed this ability to have these black screen technologies. Um, and so I do wonder, like, what was this, na you know, naturally developed in a in the, the usual way humanity progresses various industries or was this gifted from some other civilization or some other dimension or you know some genius come up with it that we didn't know about uh, it just it's so far beyond me how all of this technology can be sent through you know how is this happening the cameras and the, there's a microphone taking my and you can hear it and it can be preserved forever and it's so new you know, all of this stuff, just starting with like a phonograph records or something, that wasn't too long ago. And when that came out, people you can imagine how amazed they must have been that somebody was able to play some music and then, you know, have some grooves and a little, little disc spinning around. And then you get a pin and you put the pin in the grooves and you connect it to these certain things. And the that sound is replayed like that's still i still don't get how that works and that's 100 plus year old technology but that's not that old and how far we've progressed since then it's truly amazing and if it if it is just ingenious humans slowly progressing the technology like good job good job to us and to, to those people that did that it's, it's really amazing um though it's so amazing i really wonder like is that what happened did humans really get that um slow progression to the point that we got this these amazing technologies or were these gifted on high somewhere and and they're being given to us you know because like for instance cell phones to me the first time i saw those was on star trek as a as a kid and i always thought that was the coolest thing and and i thought that, that could never happen but somebody already thought it would happen and then it did and you wonder was it just like some of these other things that were supposedly science fiction and then became science fact? Was it really science fiction back then? Or had they already been behind the scenes creating these things and they introduced them to humanity uh, through these mediums in like a revelation of the method type of way? Uh, I wonder about these things, but again, don't have an answer either way because it's it just seems so amazing either way. <laughs> either way would be beyond me. Right. And I, th I think just in the early 1900s or even, you know, in the in the middle of, of, you know, like 1950s and 40s, I think you're right. There's a lot more going on than meets the eye that that was being told that was going on with technology. And it's that age old saying, it's like, well, imagine what they're working on now that we don't know about because they don't really release it for, you know, however long it is that they, they want to wait to release it. But I guess you do a lot of like older research or you read a lot of older books. So. 
I guess kind of and this will tie in a little bit, but like, what are your thoughts on like whenever you're doing like your your research on like older maps and just older books that are written by people? How much, um, how valid are those? You know what I'm saying? Because if the Victor writes history uh, and just with the age of technology and progression and where we're getting these books, like when you're doing like old maps and you're looking at those, how do we know that they're legit? How do we? How do we know that this is really what they meant? You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially when they have mermaids and kraken and other various sea monsters and other things in their maps. And so many of them do it. And it makes you wonder, like, why? What, why, why are these serious cartographers um, making mythological creatures uh, in their maps so often? And it makes you wonder, is that because these mythological creatures actually existed then and they were putting them in those places because that's where they could be found and it seems that way because when you read the annotations of the maps that's exactly what it says and so then you have to wonder like what is this were they like playing dungeons and dragons were these were these people fantasy role player map creators because traditional history is telling us otherwise it says that these were the cartographers of their time and these weren't hoaxes or pranks or anything. That's what they actually thought. Hmm. And you find that a lot when you look into, you know, his like Marco Polo claimed to have seen a dragon in his travels, for example. And nowadays you don't hear anybody seeing dragons or, or talking about them. So you have to wonder why do supposed historical people and books often feature a bunch of supposedly mythological elements in them. And how do you reconcile that when you're reading about them? <clears throat> and I don't have a concrete answer, um, but I tend to think that a lot of the things that are presented as mythologies um, may be real, at some, may have been real, so to speak. But I also think that a lot of things that are presented as real are just mythologies. <laughs> is another thing so um i think people are mistaken on both sides of that kind of coin um, i don't think every single thing that anyone has ever discussed was literal and i also don't think that every seemingly otherworldly um thing that has ever been discussed was just pure fantasy and mythology i absolutely think there's crossover on both ends um but it's too the gray area is, is too large to say like, um, you know, this is real, that's not real, this is real, that's not real. It's, um, I'm still in that process myself as, you know, I try to, to figure these things out. But for me, the ultimate arbiter of knowledge has to be experience or demonstrations or empirical five cents um, reality type things. So if I can verify for myself these things okay i can have a knowledge claim but when we're talking about history <clears throat> or you're talking about a map which is a representation of reality not reality itself you're already starting to remove yourself from the ability to have 100 percent surety in your determination and as long as you recognize that then you can keep going but a lot of people i guess they they're not quite so adept at discerning truth from fiction as well as just discerning what can be known versus what can't be known and you just have to accept that you don't actually know yet and and you have to be in a space of not knowing there's a lot of things in life that are like that and there's a certain type of person you might call them a religious type that doesn't like that level of uncertainty and so they'll be drawn to black and white philosophies the types i'm constantly advocating against and I'm advocating for uh, a gray area I was saying uh, my philosophy I call it the light gray because <clears throat> most things is a uh, they're presented as black and white as if it's us and them and it's either this or that but if you delve deeper there's usually three four or more sides to the story and to the point that rather than looking at it as black and white you should look at it as multiple shades of gray so many shades of gray that you can't even count them but you and and so that's kind of a middle of the road buddhist middle path kind of philosophy 
But I also think that she can do a little bit better than that in the sense that we all have uh, conscience and, and preferences and the ability to discern um, what light gray is versus dark gray in certain scenarios. But rather than being a perfectionist and trying to strive for the white all the time or thinking we are like some, some certain religious people believe about themselves, we just try to be at a light gray of everything. So for instance, with health, I, I have researched it. I tend to know what I think uh, is the healthiest human diet and exercise and lifestyle and stuff. And I try to get pretty close to the top of the mountain, but I don't think or, or fool myself into thinking that I'm completely white. I'm certainly a shade of off-white or light gray, and I'm happy to be there because when you try to over-perfectionist anything in your life, when you really try to strive to be 100% and 99% just isn't good enough, that mindset is actually pretty unhealthy. And people who are in that perfectionist mindset are some of the least likely to discern that fact because they're never going to get to the point where they realize that actually this striving for completionism and 100%ness and every little thing, uh, that's not perfect <laughs> in some cases, right? If you don't like something enough, if you um, have analysis paralysis and you're not actually progressing or, or getting output out there, uh, that completely white, that perfect, uh, that you think is so perfect, might actually not be so so perfect anymore. It's a it's a, a, a darker shade of gray than you were giving it uh, credit for. So my, it's just a long explanation of what I fancy as my light gray philosophy in the sense of most things in life, if there's two poles, two extremes, latching onto one of them or the other is rarely um, advised. The middle path is usually a better uh, path, but then also you can steer a bit towards the end that you think is better than the other end. You don't have to stay right in the middle, like the middle's the end all be all. That would be the middle ground fallacy I just uh, mentioned in a, another video. So uh, yeah, there's no light, gra <laughs> light gray fallacy. So. <laughs> yeah, that's, it, it's a slippery slope. I mean, even at just like it, existing and, and, and being in this realm uh, and just trying to pick and choose what it is you want to go throughout life or achieve, I guess. No matter which way you go, there could be issues, I guess. And at least in the Western culture or society, it seems like, you know, it's spoon fed to us. And I, I've been guilty of that or a product of that, where I hear something that I that that I found on on my phone and I, and I think of it as being true, you know, and then I start telling people, oh, hey, did you hear that? You know, that they, they put the American flag down over here and, and, you know, during during a time of duress or whatever. And then I, I was completely wrong. That never really even happened. I just took someone's word for it. You know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. people are so quick to consume information and then spew it out as truth. And, and you know that I'm sure people have said things that have came out of your mouth that you never even said, or they took mm -hmm. a clip of one of your videos and, and put words in your mouth type of thing. And oh, Eric, Eric Dubé is this way and Eric Dubé, blah, blah, blah. And then then you have millions of people watch that thing and then they think of it as true. And then now their perception of what really what's going on in reality isn't even true in the first place because uh, because of, I guess, disinformation mm -hmm. and mainstream media likes to use that word a lot, disinformation. But I, I guess for me, and, and you, you explain it a great way, man, it's just like you got to kind of just sit back, you know, and just kind of observe what's going on and, you know, take your time. You know, it doesn't have to happen instantaneous. We don't need this instant gratification. You don't need to know the answer right now. Just kind of relax and enjoy life type of thing. And I think that that is the biggest problem in America is just rushing and impatience and being impatient. And, mm. and you know, that's, I guess, with me and my journey just here recently, man, I've just slowed it down. I've slowed it down. I'm, I'm enjoying it more. And, and you know, the best thing about all of this, Eric, is that, like I said, man, I haven't been on social media. I haven't been watching TV. I don't know what's going on in the news. I don't know. I've heard about the war in Israel and Palestine. You know what I'm saying? But mm -hmm. that's the extent of it, man. I haven't done any research on it. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm having Eric Dubay on my show. And I'm like, I don't know if this is the best time or the worst time because I haven't been watching any social media. I haven't been watching it. You know what I'm saying? I've watched a couple of your videos and, and some other YouTubers as well, but um 
I don't know, man. I, I'm right there with you with the with the gray line thing. It's just like, and I tell myself I'm in the middle, but am I really in the middle? I don't know. Mm. Can you can you just exist and not do any of those things? <laughs> <laughs> right. When you um you asked about the Thailand versus America, and now talking about waiting and future and present mindset, that made me think of one thing that I do notice. Uh, they do have a slower pace of life over there, and you do feel that people are more in the present moment. So when you walk down a street uh, in Thailand, most people are walking very slowly and looking left and right and talking and and very involved in their present moment. Even like the motorcycle taxi guys, for example, who their whole life is just sitting there at a, a curb, at a corner of a block, the same block usually, you know, for years, day in, day out. But they are in the present moment. They are watching who's passing and, and ready for you if you're, you know, if, if you're there and uh, just you can, and, and when people walk down the street here, it's like a, there's like this laser focus and they're trying to get to their destination and they're walking much faster, not looking left or right, usually not talking. doesn't seem like they're in the present moment. They're in some future moment in their head and their present is trying to quickly get to that thing. Uh, same in, on the road here. Uh, over there, it's much more chill. Coming back here, people are absolutely in a rush to get to, I don't know where, the next red light? Because they <laughs> rush right past you and then you, you're stopped right behind them. And you're like, what's, what's this all about? Um, so yeah, hurry up and wait seems to be a big mentality over here. Um, and I think we would do well to slow down, live in the moment, look left and right. You can have plans and be striving have ambitions and going for whatever you want in the future but enjoy the ride on the way there because um, if you get involved in that kind of mindset what happens is when that future that you really want that you're trying to bring into your existence when it happens if you've developed this constant future longing and unable to wait and and a fast-paced lifestyle um, trying to get, 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 trying to succeed, ambition, all that. How much presence and space of mind, uh, peace of mind, do you have to enjoy that thing when it becomes your present moment? Will you truly be present with that thing when it comes to fruition? And will it be worth it? If you've changed yourself so much that you're just this always involved in future longing and ambitious struggles to create a better future for yourself and all this, are you actually going to appreciate the fruits of your labor when it becomes your your now? Or are you now going to be so involved in this future process, this rat on a spinning wheel trying to get whatever it is, that now it's not even worth it? <laughs> and uh, it's, talking about it now, it's, it's maybe easy to be like, oh, no, I wouldn't do that or I'm not doing that. But a lot of people, it just unconsciously starts to happen you just fall out of the present moment get involved in that little hamster wheel in your brain of how you want the world to be and how you want your life to be versus just how it is because it just is how it is and what you're thinking about is an abstraction from reality and if you get too involved in that you're really just living in your imagination it's a whole fantasy world about the real, a real future that you're going to create for yourself. But if you're always in it, it's never a reality. It's always a fantasy, even if you create it, because you won't be enjoying it. You'll still be creating the next fantasy because this one's not enough. And I'm yeah. so used to you. <laughs> that is so trippy, man. Have you ever experienced that in yourself? I mean, I well, now that, now have... that you describe it, yes. I'm like, that's insane. <laughs> I've never thought of it like that. <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, we're talking about addictions. This is like another one. You don't even have to take any substance or anything. It happens in your own brain. So you don't even have to scroll through anything. You don't have to smoke anything or drink anything. This is a addictive thought pattern that you probably only really notice if you started meditating enough and then noticing that you're like, why can't I stop thinking? And then what is the thing you're always thinking about? For some people, it's the future like that. 
For others, it's the past. And they'll just have some traumatic event or some unresolved conflict or something like that, that they will, their brain will always go back to it. And so when they try to tell their brain, okay, relax, let's have some me time. Let's just have some peace. Their brain will instantly go back to a childhood trauma that hasn't been resolved. And, you know, why did they do this to me? I can't believe they did that. And they, they don't feel they have the ability to not do that. It's just an automatic thing. And every time they want to just have nothing, this thing pops up instead. So it's, for some people, it's the past. For some people, it's the future. And I would recommend meditation for everybody, obviously. But a lot of people don't do it because of these things. But I would say that's the whole thing. Like, medita the end goal of meditation is to maybe one day, sometimes, when you go to sit in meditation, you won't think anything. That's, that's what that, it's not, hey, what's this meditation thing? Oh, you're supposed to sit and not think. Okay, let me try. Can't do it. I'm done. Like, <laughs> it's just like gymnastics. It's like you see somebody doing like huge back handsprings and double, triple back flips and twists. And then you're like, here, try a handstand and you fall on your face and you're like, can't do it. It's like, well, chill. <laughs> Everything in life requires practice and it, you slowly progress as it goes. And you don't have to beat yourself up just because of your starting position. And everybody starts in the same position. And so, and that position is you sit there and you think constantly and you don't even have a single second of space where you don't think because even you, you're telling yourself, okay, stop thinking. Is you thinking? And the second you stop telling yourself to stop thinking, you start thinking something else. That's that, fine. That's fine. <laughs> that's how it starts. And the whole point is just to sit through that. And, and, that process, what I'm saying, how is that not beneficial? If every time you um, stop thinking about whatever else is going on in your life, boom, this childhood trauma, this unresolved conflict comes up, oh, well, that's your subconscious telling you, this is a really important thing that you need to spend some time thinking about. You can't just distract yourself with entertainment and go about your work life and pretend like this isn't an incredibly important issue to your life. It's so psychologically uh, detrimental to you that you have zero peace because of it. You cannot shut your brain off because this thing will always just come up. So recognize that. But a lot of people won't if you don't intentionally meditate first. They'll, it'll just be another subconscious thing constantly dragging them down and making them depressed and they don't know why. Well, try not thinking about anything for a while. You're going to start, see, oh, oh, and then that's your new inner work. So meditation isn't just about not thinking. It's about trying not to think and then seeing what thoughts happen. And then when they do, well, it's okay to delve into them. That's what I've done as well. For me, meditation hasn't just been, mm, and I'm not thinking anything. No, it's, um, I attempt to not think anything, but instead, here's what comes up. All right, then I'm going to think about that. But I'm not going to do anything else but think about that, which is what a lot of people don't do. They'll be scrolling and thinking about something, cooking and thinking about something, talking and thinking about something. Do they actually sit there by themselves and maybe stop for a few hours? I mean, sometimes if I have traumatic events, I've stopped for many, many hours. I can't, I, it's how I deal with trauma now is I sit <laughs> with it. I don't do anything. Uh, if, if something negative happens and throws me off kilter, then I'm probably going to take a nap. <laughs> and then when I wake up, I'm going to be quiet and introverted and by myself and going through that thing until I feel it's gained resolution. And then I'm going to get back to my balance point and be social and do whatever I need to do. But I'm not going to just pretend like like that wasn't traumatic and then keep going on. And then, and then it becomes this thing, like I'm saying, they become these bubbles of thought. They, they don't go away. <laughs> you can't just right. work, work through these things. And so, um, yeah, just to close off. Meditation is a process of inner work and intentionally thinking about things. Sometimes meditation is thinking. You should think about that thing, resolve it so that you, next time you can actually, when it does pop up, you can say, no, you know what? I already did every, I thought of every eventuality, every potential possibility, everything that happened. I have already put my ducks in a row. I've already put those puzzle pieces together. You pop that bubble when it comes up 
and and it may come up a couple times, but it just becomes so easy to pop now because you're like, no, I investigated this bubble. There is nothing interesting there to me anymore. And you might re realize that how addictive and annoying and traumatizing constantly thinking about this bubble is, and then it becomes even easier to pop it. You're like, no, this is now my my thing is, I have I'm addicted to this past trauma for some reason, and I need to chill, and I need to, you know be able to have the freedom, the space to not think when I want to. And that's the the whole process of meditation. The end goal is to maybe get to that state sometimes. And not, again, not black and white. Why would you want to not think? It's an amazing technology right here. We're not trying to not use it. It's just that you want to have a active shut off button that actually works. When you click off, it's off rather than click off and it just keeps going just as fast as when it's clicked on. And like, okay, so I'm broken a bit here. That's all that is. It's trying to fix that that switch. I think that that's very interesting that you put it that way because a, a lot of people when they have problems like that and, and they're going through processes where their their subconscious is telling them, hey, you need to deal with it. A lot of people, like you said, just shut that out and they continue about their business and years go by and years go by and it's something that haunts them. And it's something that might go away temporarily, but later on in life it comes back because they haven't dealt with it yet. And for me, I think that that's the biggest thing. And one of the biggest things that I struggle with is why we are here in the first place when it comes to when we talk about the elites or the top 1% and how they control us and all those types of things. And again, what I struggle with the most is like stuff like meditation, things that are very important to the human being and the progression of what it is to live this life. And it, it, it all starts with public education because that's probably where 80 to 90 percent of, of all Americans go to consume their education. And one of the first things that I, one of the very first memories that I have when I was in kindergarten is like one of my core memories going in there. I just remember TV and then there was like this little video game that you could it was like a handheld thing and it had a little uh, like a like an earth ball on it. And one of the first things I'm learning in kindergarten is about space and about how the earth is round and about all these things as opposed to a handbook on how to treat struggles later on in life, like meditation. And I think that's so important to learn how to meditate at a very young age. That way you can use that tool later on in life to deal with the struggles that you talked about. I've had um, Andrew Hol Holacek on, he's from Colorado. He talks, he, he wrote a book called uh, Dream Work Yoga and he goes into lucid dreaming and how you can you know, participate in lucid dreaming with yoga. You know what I'm saying? And, and that's just uh, lucid dreaming. That's probably some next level stuff, man. I mean, I've done it a few times, but just meditation in general, how important it is and how you just described it. I think that that should be taught in schools as opposed to space and stars and traveling millions of miles away to other galaxies and stuff like that. Just yeah. Can we have some inner space before you start propagandizing yes. us with this outer space nonsense? Yes. And that would and be that, another thing that uh, ties do as well. I would give that uh, give them credit to that as they do teach meditation from a very young age. So most children have at least had some experience with meditation since childhood growing up. And I do think that's very beneficial. That would be one thing that you know would help in the West if we gave more attention to that and, and actually tried to um, get, get people involved right from childhood. A hundred percent, man. And I've I've been in I've gone through spurts of meditating. Um, for me, what worked best was like doing a self guided meditation. There's a guy on YouTube named Michael Seeley. He's a really good guy. The guy that guides you, um, and everyone's different. You know, you like your mind to be shut off. You don't want to hear yourself thinking. But Michael Seeley, man, I just I listen to him, and he's got one. And this is where it really tripped me out, Eric. And when I knew that meditation was the real deal, um, is he did like a self guided meditation on the seven chakras. And I'd never experienced feeling my chakras before, and nor do I know what all of them mean. Um, I guess it could be different for everyone, but he guided me, man. And I swear to you, Eric, I felt every single chakra through his guided meditation. And that's when I was blown away about meditating. And I, and I, and I kind of went deeper into it, you know, doing it on my own and doing my own breath work. And I had some pretty profound experiences with meditation. And yeah, I'm right there with you, man. In, in order to solve problems, that's that's a must have for Americans. And I think that would be beneficial for sure. Yeah, yeah, we got thinking down pat, but not thinking, that's <laughs> that's something we could use some work on. And that's the same thing with the past and future mindset versus the present. The present mindset isn't really thinking. 
What is there to think about if you're actually truly engaged and involved in your present moment? Thinking is a past future thing. And I do find that it's actually quite climate based in the sense that you'll find that most cultures that exist in the tropics and along the equator uh, have a very present oriented mindset. Whereas uh, people who live in a you know further north or um, the further you get from the tropics, they get much more involved in past and future thought. And it makes sense in that sense, because when you're dealing with seasons and you can only have a certain time that you can grow every year and it becomes deathly cold in the winter and there's nothing that you can eat and you have to provide for heat, you have to prepare for these things. Um, it's very different than say when you're living in Thailand, there's just food is just growing around you all the time and it's never going to be so cold that you die because you're homeless. Um, it just survival is much easier there. And it, because of that, you can chill. <laughs> you can develop a type of present based mindset that our ancestors, you know, it's less so now because of all this technology. We don't really have to be so involved in past and future thought as our ancestors. But you can imagine how they, before the technology that we have now, like refrigerators and modern heating capabilities and other things like that, how much planning they would have to do and how seasonal their lifestyles would have to be to the point that you, you're basically a, a, a puppet of nature in that if you don't plant your corn this week and you don't um, pull up your potatoes at this time and you don't um, get your firewood ready at this time and you don't have all of these steps, you just die. <laughs> so, so people, we've developed a type of mindset that is very future, especially oriented. And when that happens, the past also, they come simultaneously because they're mind created phenomena that don't actually exist. <laughs> There is no such thing as the future. There is no such thing as the past. Uh, when the past happened, it was the present. And when the future happens, it will be the present. And there never is anything but that. And so all of our thoughts are abstractions from this one moment that we're not enjoying <laughs> the whole time that we're involved in trying to make it other than whatever it is. Um, and so to survive in certain climates, you need to develop that kind of mindset. And I think that's a big part of why we see it in these northern kind of climates more so than you know somewhere like Mexico or Ecuador or Thailand or something. They're just living in the moment and it seems to come easy to them. And um, culturally and historically, I think this plays a big part in it. But nowadays um, it's more individualized and it's really up to you how um, present oriented or past and future oriented your mindset is because it's no longer really based on survival in 2023. It's based on you and your addictions or your level of self-development to get out of that kind of uh, trap, which is really what most all past and future thought is, is a little bit for survival and to create a lifestyle for yourself that that is good. Obviously, like I said, it's, it's not black and white. This, this is a great tool that can create <laughs> wonderful things for us. But if you can't shut it off, like anything, if it's just running 24 seven, well, then you can't clean it. You can't rest it. It's just, and eventually it's gonna explode. You know, Eventually it's just gonna wear out because of that action. So it needs to be taken care of the same way any machine, as that, the analogy goes, would be. No, 100%, yeah. Uh, and do you, do you think that, uh, I mean, obviously, who? I, I don't know really like the right way to phrase this, but I guess the the, the powers that be, the people who are in control, they, they know this process. They know they, they they've kind of put these things in front of us to where we don't know how to clean or reset. You know, this the, the technology that we have inside of our brains, and it, and it has to be by design, and that's the reason why it is. But um, do you think that they play a big part into it, or is there self choice? Obviously, there is. You know, like I've kind of waken up here recently, and I've seen it. But it, it doesn't change the fact that all those things out there exist, all those addictions out there exist because of them. I, I don't know if you kind of buy into that at all, or do you think it's more self-choice for people 
to discover what it is that we're truly here for. And if there is no past and there's no future, and I like that analogy, and I think you're completely right, right with that. All you have is really the present, and people lose sight of that. Um, I guess, what do you what do you think the true nature of what it is to be a human is? Is it different for everyone? I know that's kind of a two part question, but if if you realize that and you don't live in your imagination, right, and create this fantasy world that that you desire, and you just stick yourself in the present and understand what that is, I guess. What do you kind of think the purpose of life is in, in that scenario, I guess, is what I'm asking. Well, again, also not going black and white with it because uh, imagination and fantasy and um, losing yourself um, in, in, in that or, or escapism even to some degree, I think is great and fine and warranted and can be a psychological healer. Um, so I'm not saying that you have to avoid them completely, but again, rather saying that you want it within your control so that you can you got the little on and off switch more so than it controlling you and taking you where it wants to go so to speak um so and and i guess i do think that's pretty individualized there may be systems in place addictions technologies out there trying to suck you in but ultimately we all have uh, the ability to engage or disengage with those things and i would again just say to find your light gray area with those things rather than trying to completely disengage um, and acting like there's no benefit whatsoever, but just find where the, the good balance point for yourself is. And yeah, it's, it's, it's up to us. I don't, I don't know if there's some big grand plan like you mentioned, uh, this whole like human existence is trying to drive us towards something. Um, like I've questioned the, the whole soul trap uh, idea or, you know, whether it, is this reality we're experiencing the only reality? Is there some other dimensions? Or could they be better than this one? And if they are, why, why am I not there? How do I get there? Um, and and if if there are, there, there must, in, in my estimation, there must be, because uh, if so, if God, say, is omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, you can do anything. That's the whole point. You can create whatever you want. So if you didn't create absolute perfect a heavenly place with absolute perfect people just absolutely blissing out, having a great time all the time, which that's got to be possible. Don't tell me that's not possible. Then what who you got to appreciate the, the, the darkness or the black. OK, all right. So we, that you can have a way to do that without having it be as dark as it is here i would say we're living in kind of a dark gray reality i wouldn't even call this reality um you know the, the yin yang type of thing and it's like well you got it because that's what people will say when you whenever you start to dog on this reality or you question god in any way everyone's like <laughs> they, they get all you know so <clears throat> but for for me i'm not seeing how for instance why do we have to eat other living things so that we survive. So the whole basis of survival in this reality is that we have to take, consume the life of other things. It's predatory and superior, what's the word? It, it, you're, you're determining that you're superior to this plant and this animal. You know, I'm gonna kill this plant, I'm gonna kill this animal, and now I get to survive a couple, a little bit longer in this reality. Like, that's, why? You could, if, if you were God, you could have created a reality where you survive regardless and you don't need to, and, or you just eat things that are inanimate and, you know, have zero sentience or ability to feel pain or, you know, to have their own conscious individual experiences. Why, why do we have to kill things that are beautiful and alive just so that we can remain beautiful and alive? It's like, that's not how things have to be. That's how this reality was designed. And people that just want to sing songs to their benevolent creator all day and think that you have to praise him and that's the only th and believe in him and that's the only thing you can do because otherwise if you criticize, question or have skepticism or doubt in any way, then you're going to go to the evil dark place and for eternity and you'll be damned there in, in a lake of fire and all, all these. What? Um, 
<laughs> so these same people that are talking about their benevolent God that they sing songs to are also talking about this. So how black and white is that? And all I'm saying is I just want to be in the gray area where I don't think anybody really knows what the heck they're talking about. So I'm just going to remain agnostic about the whole thing. And then everybody turns at you because then you're too gray for them. And they're like, be black and white like us. There is no God. Don't you know? Be an atheist, Eric. Or all the Christians are like, you'll learn one day when you accept Jesus. Like I haven't, like I haven't been gone to church for half my life, and my entire family's. They they talk to me like I have no idea what Christianity is, or what it means to have a relationship with Jesus, or to accept Jesus into my heart, or to read the Bible. Or go to, I've done it all, guys. Come on, give me some credit. <laughs> but it's funny in the comments, like the the religious people, they just think that you haven't had your religious moment yet. That's what it is. You just haven't come to it yet. Um, but uh, for me, you know, there's there's a gray area here. I, why does it, why does the pleasure of me eating, mm, eh, all right, even the most delicious food possible, yep, I eat it and it's gone in ten seconds, and yeah, that was good. That was the whole life of something else, and it it doesn't get to live anymore. And you can't tell me that that little pleasure. Mm, was better than the pain that this plant or animal would have had to experience to have its life ripped away from it. No matter how painlessly you try to do that, it's a you know living organism that strives to continue living and has its own <laughs> life, and you're ending it for that sense pleasure. And especially if it's an animal, th it hurts. <laughs> you wa watch slaughterhouse videos. What you watch, whatever you think is what do they call it? Humane slaughter. See, watch what that looks like, and and try to live with that. Like ev before every ham sandwich, like watch that because that's what you're doing. Um, and if you don't, then <laughs> meanwhile praising the the benevolent creator. It's like, mm -hmm. okay. So because <laughs> so because because I question the creator and then become vegan, I'm like, uh, you know. It's like, no, you have to agree with this whole system. You have to you have to praise the creator of this dark gray reality and then participate in it in that way, you know, because they're usually all meat eaters as well. What trying to tell me that this reality is hundred percent perfect and I just need to accept their version version of God so that I can see through the fact that you know this reality isn't questionable in the sense that I'm saying, what why do we have to eat things? And why is the pleasure of us eating things so much less than the pain that the things we eat have to go through? It could be the opposite. Killing things could just be like, eh, oh. it doesn't even hurt, and it's like nothing. And then the pleasure you get from it is just like ecstatic, orgasmic. It's like, oh my god. <laughs> like, nothing's that way. Even a real orgasm is just kind of like, yep, yeah. okay. And now that's that's like the most, uh, um, what would you call it? Uh, banally pleasurable experience that everybody can can have, okay, and it's that's all it is, you know, or or a great food or something, or being connected to to your wife or your kids or something. Great. Now compare that to medieval torture, you know, eight hours on a stretching device that's slowly pulling you apart and your limbs are just breaking one at a time, or you know, somebody that flays your skin completely just until there's nothing left and you're still alive, but you have zero skin left. And then maybe they turn on a some harsh light. Or whatever. There's so many crazy torture methods that exist in this reality. And again, didn't have to. God could have created us so that we're impenetrable to such things or so that pain didn't hurt that much. It's like so, you're saying, oh, yin yang, you need pain to understand what pleasure is. Okay, but do we need that much pain? Because so you're telling me that my skin flayed off and just in the sunlight and birds pecking on me, which is a potential reality, uh, is worth it so that I can have yummy food and an orgasm once in a while. They don't feel that good compared to the level of pain that's possible. And you don't have to tell me that that type that, uh, you know, I wish food tasted way better and sex felt way better and emotional connection felt way better and pain didn't hurt as much because it, it's possible. Do you well, think... So do you think, okay, so just, I got like two, two, two questions to that. But I, I guess my first question, the first one would be, okay, so for like, for sexual pleasure and, and stuff like that, 
that's a, another one of those things you barely learn about it in school. And I, I get that at a young age. You don't really want to subject children to sexuality. I, I completely understand that. But there is a, a time and place for it. And it's not necessarily taught to us on how to enjoy it and how to maximize it. That's just my, my thought on that. But my second part would be with, I completely agree like with the food aspect and how we're killing living organisms so that we can stay alive and, and the pain that they go through and just the, the pain and torture that's existed throughout this realm for thousands of years that, that you describe and talk about. It, it's true that it, it exists and it is there and it is happening. But I guess what I, my question would be, whoever these rulers are or the elite that I keep describing or the top 1%, depending on how long that they've been in control, I guess is what I'm asking. Could they have kind of created that environment and maybe before that they existed if we truly were hunter gatherers that pain was still going on with animals but when it comes to torture with each other and other human beings maybe that didn't exist until those people got into place and kind of psychologically fucked up uh, human beings i guess if that makes sense we certainly continue on with the torture and the the trauma and everything Though this is the question that's like, like I said, the art imitates life, life imitates art. Did, were, was this realm created in such a way that it's predatory? And so, yeah, we develop predatory instincts and predatory psychology and things like psychopaths and narcissists because that's the type of reality that's been set up for us. And maybe that's why the elite become the elite and that they resonate with this, you know, the god of this world, so to speak, you know, if the god of this world is Satan or a demiurge, you know, as like the Gnostics would have said, and not the the monotheistic benevolent creator, but rather some something below that. Uh, well, then why would you, you know, you need to recognize that and not act like that being needs your worship and that this created place by him is something that you're supposed to um, change or enjoy or anything other than, you know, perhaps this reality is meant to be condemned, for example. You know, what if there truly is a much better reality out there and we're being barred from it because of our hypnosis, our entrancement and attraction to certain things that are in this reality, and that may be why we're here. Um, and so, but but if, unless we recognize, and that, so for instance, I think I, I just put out this video about agnosticism and um, Pascal's wager. So he, he thinks that um, if you believe in God, the Christian God, well, it makes sense because then you'll get to go to heaven and you don't have to go to hell. But if you don't believe in God and God exists, well, you're out of luck. You go to hell and you didn't get into heaven. But if God didn't exist, well, he's not out of anything because all he did is believe in something that doesn't exist. And uh, you're both completely annihilated at your death anyway, and no nothing really mattered. So for him, it's a it's a good wager to just believe in God, just do it. Because if you did exist, you get to go to heaven. It's a good good deal. But what if? Here's another potential. What if that God, the Abrahamic God that he's talking about, that guarantees uh, uh, infinite heaven and damns you to infinite hell if you don't believe in him? And his main his whole thing is belief. Everything hinges on belief. Well, people are finding that when they have near-death experiences, that whatever they believe in seems to happen to them. So people that believe that they're going to see a dead relative or they really want to, yeah, their Grammy comes and starts uh, telling them what the afterlife is about. Or people that were Christian their whole lives, a 15-foot Jesus appears to them and starts telling them you know, what their afterlife experience is going to be all about. And they are just as entranced with that experience as they are with this one and just as easily led as they are with this one and i'm just recommending what if we just stop for a second think for ourselves instead of just going along with this idea that everybody says that this reality is perfect and you have to love this reality and you have to love the creator of this reality that way you get to go to heaven and it'll be an even better place and if you don't you're gonna be damned to hell forever so you better appreciate this place and love it and love worship the creator um i'm saying what if Belief is the main th the main thing that this demiurge wants from us is because belief is the thing that gets us to keep on coming back here. If 
we believe in Jesus or we believe in reincarnation or we believe in whatever, anything. That, this is why I'm recommending agnosticism. Anything that we believe beforehand, and belief means not knowing, but basically uh, giving it a knowledge title without actually knowing it. That's what belief is. It replaces knowing without being nearly as voracious and, and not warranted either. It's like if it was warranted, you'd say you knew it, but you can't. So you just say you believe it and then you condemn everyone else who doesn't fall into that epistemic stance. So what if your belief is what traps you and keeps you coming back here? So because you believe in Jesus, you see, you see Jesus and Jesus convinces you to come back or you believe um, this dead relative is actually your dead relative and is trying to convince you. What if you just wait until, you know, the afterlife happens or doesn't happen? Maybe none of this happens. Maybe that's just a near-death experience thing, and when you actually die, you're just dead. There is no conscious experience. You don't know that. All, every religious person that thinks they know that they're going to go to heaven doesn't actually know that. You believe it. And, but, and you also believe that if you don't believe it, that you're going to have bad things happen to you. And that's the main reason I think that the Abrahamic religions have risen to such prominence is because of this carrot on a stick mentality that it promotes where it bribes you with the ultimate bribe of heaven and threatens you with the ultimate intimidation of hell. And it's as easy as Pascal's wager to just get the good thing. It's like, okay, so I just say I believe, and I don't even have to go to church or really act like a Christian, right? But, but I'm, but, and then, but I can use it and be all holier than thou anytime, uh, anytime I want to use it against other people, which is what I find so often. It's religious people are the first ones to start condemning you for any, anything you've ever done. Meanwhile, saying that, you know, don't, don't judge anyone. My, my Jesus doesn't judge anyone. And it's like, you're so judgmental. And, and everyone is. It's not even like, like I'm just I just don't hide it. It's like yeah, of course I'm a, a judgment. If you weren't judgmental, you'd probably die from crossing the road at a wrong time. You know, yeah. you mis you misjudged when to cross the road and the car hit you. People that are acting like judgment is this negative thing again, being too black and white about it. <laughs> no, yeah, overly judging someone, miswarranting judgment, and these kind of things. Of course, that's wrong, but. Uh, acting like you can just go through life without judgments or, and, you should, and well, okay, you can judge crossing the street, but don't judge other people. Oh, really? So, so now you're going to get married to a psychopath and you're going to have, you know, have kids with the wrong person. All don't judge people. Yeah, you got to judge people. Everyone judges people and just accept it instead of a acting like you are able to not do this, this thing that everyone does. <clears throat> which, again, getting back to the religious folks, it's this black and white thinking where they want to come out of the muck of grayness. They see everybody else is in grayness. Maybe they were, they tended to be in the dark gray. And then the religion uh, offers them a clean white slate and, and they get to just, whoop, they get to pass all of this, this personal work, <laughs> all this stuff that most people have been working through to slowly trudge through, like, oh, try to do meditation and yoga and try to increase my spiritual. And then these people are just like, all I do is believe in Jesus, right? <laughs> oh, and then they get to look down at you like, well, one day you'll probably believe Eric, you know, and you might get to my heights of spiritual, whatever. <laughs> oh, okay. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for bestowing some judgment on me from up high. You're welcome. I was, I was involved in drugs and alcohol for my entire life. I beat my kids and I was in a motorcycle gang and I killed people. And, but last week I found Jesus, Eric. And, you know, hopefully, hopefully you'll come to, you'll come around. <laughs> it's just funny to me. Um, that's often what I see. And, and it's what it promotes because it, it, and it's good in that sense that it gives people that easy feeling of forgiveness because you should be able to do that for yourself that's the thing you don't need jesus to do it for you but it helps other people if they've had a bad history they've had traumatizing pasts and they don't think that they can have a new identity and still live in this world well you know oh through christ i can my sins are absolved and everything okay i mean that's one way buddhists do it too by the way you know and so do other people in other religions or people without religion. There's ways of self-cleansing that you can remove those kind of obstacles from your life, um, you know, regardless of which middleman you claimed helps you through it. Um, 
Did I have a point here? I'm going on a rant. No, no. So, I think, I, so, for, so, so on that, I think. So, just real quick, I think we want the easiest path as human beings. At least, again, what Western society, what society has created for us, is we want the easiest thing possible. And like anything that's hard, your mind just kind of just shuts down, and it's just like, no, I'm not going to do that. It's going to be too hard. And it's not even that like you put a lot of thought process into it. Just once you realize that that it's going to be the tiniest bit of hard, that's when you get disinterested in it. Uh, at least for people who are probably at the very beginning stages of their spiritual awakening or journey or whatever it is. So yeah, I, I'm right there with you. Like it, the religion has found the best play call and play call history. You know what I'm saying? Just love God, love Jesus. And like you said, it doesn't matter what you do. You're going to pass all these other people who have been working on themselves to better themselves. And you're just going to surpass them and you're okay. Like I completely understand that. And that's very frustrating. But I guess my, my question to you about what you just talked about is, do you believe that the universe, or we could, we will call it this realm, can speak to you, right? Or do you think that, or do you believe in coincidences, I guess? Because there have been times, Eric, where I've like reached out to God or prayed, and I was like, hey, I, I really need some help right now. Show me a sign, right? And then, you know, something weird really happened, like extremely weird, something that I didn't think was going to happen, it happened. Are you a believer in that or are you more of a believer in like it's just a coincidence and it just happened because it was supposed to? Mm. Um, I've had overwhelmingly eerie coincidences that to me make more sense as synchronicities. And so it, that would be the difference between Jungian worldview and, and non. So he would say that there's a collective unconscious that operates behind everything. And that's kind of what I was saying about how everyone is an NPC anyway, because there's this stream of human consciousness that everyone is part of, just like you could say there's a stream of dog consciousness that every dog is part of. But your dog has his own life, and he's different than other dogs in certain ways, and he becomes individuated to this, to, in ways that you fall in love with, just like you do with, with people. Um, and <laughs> yeah, the, the more individuated they become, the more lovable they are too because then they don't seem like everyone else and it's the same with people the more of like an npc they are the more it seems like they're just a copy a carbon copy of anyone else and they're not so special or lovable or appreciable in that sense so in that sense it's another reason to want to individuate it's like you become you have more value to other people and to yourself to actually to be more yourself that's what individuating is it's finding out who you truly are getting out of this stream of who humanity is, and then deciding, well, okay, obviously I'm this, 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 and this, but this thing, this isn't really me. And then you stop and you just let humanity continue on with with its impetus. And you're like, but for me, that's, nope, you know, for me, <laughs> Earth is flat. 99.99% <laughs> of uh, humanity just keeps on going, but I got to stick in my craw on, on it and I just keep going. And then you start, other people start sticking and they start believing Hey, wait a minute. I, I, uh, the thing I thought I knew, I don't know. And uh, I'm getting off topic again. What, what was the question that you originally Just had if, me? If, if you believed in coincident, coincidences oh, that's, or that's if that's you talked to... Yeah. Sorry. And so in the Jungian view of this collective unconscious that we're all involved in some um, mass consciousness, coincidences, really, it doesn't work that way. If, we're all, if there's a collective unconscious, uh, coincidence would be better termed something like synchronicity in that the, it uh, that which he uh, defines as a meaningful coincidence so it's something that seems to be coincidental but it, it's been brought together by a meaning and an intentionality and i don't necessarily think that it always happens like if you intend long enough that you manifest things like the, the secret law of attraction style um i think there's some of that but you really need to put action into <laughs> into it as well as the main thing that the, that law of attraction philosophy leaves out. It's like, yeah, it's all well and good to attract things into your life, but you also want to go towards the thing you're attracting rather than just acting like, no, I'm just going to sit here and try to get it through mental capacity alone and not take any physical actions in the world to make it happen other than um, visualizing. It's like, yeah, visualize it. Again, black and white. It's like you're, using, you're taking one tool and then saying this one tool is completely white 
and you don't need to do any other thing whatsoever. It's like, no, it's just kind of one gray tool and then use it with physical action and ambition and, and other pieces of the puzzle. And then you're way more likely to manifest things that you want. Um, so I'm going off topic again, but uh, <laughs> synchronicity. Yeah, I think that there is a collective unconscious. We're all involved in uh, in it. So when you think something is a coincidence, there's probably a bit more to it than that. But also, I don't go so far that every single thing that you think, you know, I, I thought about her today and then she called me. So that must be that must mean that we're connected and uh, she heard my thought or, or whatever. Like people can take it too far. And I don't think it's necessarily on that level. Like, um, you know, <laughs> don't don't think about somebody you don't want to <laughs> call you. Otherwise, they will. It's not that um, deterministic or anything. But there are things that happen. Like I've I've dreamed future scenarios that then happen, and that's not really a synchronicity to me. That that's speaking to the whole nature of reality and time itself. That it's not necessarily as easy. As, well, like I said, past and future don't really exist. So when you dream a future scenario, well, it's it's the present. So you're not really. It's not that amazing. <laughs> it's just this present, uh, just a version of it that. Uh, hasn't happened yet and when it does happen you already had a version of it happen in your consciousness and so when you see it with your eyes and feel it um, you're just like amazed that there was that connection but uh, I think reality is kind of like a DVD in that sense that yeah well it's already all there you can fast forward and in that sense it's the future or you can rewind and in that sense it's the past of the movie but the entire thing is all right there all the time and you can pinpoint, um, pause, do, do anything you want at any time. And I would assume that reality is that way based on my investigations into it for 41 years. It doesn't seem to be this thing that's just out there, runs as it is, and then we come into it and we're dealing with the mechanical system. It actually seems like we are part of the system, we change it, consciousness is the main operating function of the system and our consciousness is part of it but that's another thing when i talk about the potential of a malevolent deity or something like that uh, it would be one of many and so i'm not saying that all of reality is dark or uh, there would have to be or, or, or that it's separate from us it could be us in that sense and that we're fooling ourselves and when we believe in certain things these things that present themselves to us in our afterlife it's just aspects of ourself so it's jesus 15 foot jesus or granny or whatever it might be but if i'm saying if we remain agnostic enough to not just believe when when we're presented with something that it is what it says it is and just maintain that level of skepticism that we have and should probably always have i would imagine most people have this thing i have it to a heavy degree, I think. And so when I, you know, if my grandmother isn't acting like my grandmother and, and maybe I don't know I'm dead yet, it, I'd just be wondering like, why is she acting this way? Is this really my grandmother? Am I dead? <laughs> Whereas other people might just be like, Grammy, oh my God, Grammy, I miss you. Uh, and then you're lost in the experience. And so for me, skepticism has like the way, skepticism and doubt are filters for arriving at truth whereas belief and faith are not <laughs> they are ways at easily being diluted would be a way to put it if if you've seen the veracity of something and it's been proven and so you know it well what why would you even use the vernacular of belief or faith so you either know it or you don't or you don't know it, but you use this word called belief, where it's like you have a foregone conclusion and then you use it as a snooty mechanism over everyone else who actually lives in reality where they just don't know the things that they don't know. But you're just like, no, I know it. You, because I believe. And believe, suddenly, belief has this higher weight to it than knowledge. That's great. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. And you want to tell me that God ordains that? Right. God says so. God says belief is better than knowledge. You need belief or else you're damned to eternal hell. And it's like, yeah, but knowledge is a way better epistemic function than belief. Why would God force us to, to use this function 
at the expense of the other one. Force us to have belief in something we don't know at the expense of this wonderful function called knowledge. Sounds <laughs> kind of like sounds kind of like a narcissist, if you ask me. Yeah, it sounds like gaslighting. I was saying yeah. that in the co comments yesterday. So God's a gaslighter. Either way, it's not looking good. So um, what, are you, what are your thoughts on? So I, I just, after like having this conversation so far, there's just so many different layers. It's like an onion, obviously, of just how complex that this life is. And I'm just curious, like, with, on your spiritual journey and just like the processes that you've gone through to better yourself and be the best version of you, if that exists out there. I know that's what we're all we all want to attain by, but we're humans and we're not perfect, so we say. Do you think that our body is capable of doing more? Not like a superhero, but like, you know, when you, you feel like something's wrong and you have that gut feeling, and, and they always, and, and nine out of ten times, your gut's almost always right about that feeling, right? So I think it's crazy that your body's in tune with what's going on in reality and people don't really notice it. And, and that's just small scale. So I guess what I'm asking is like through your spiritual journey and like understanding who you are and what your body's capable of doing, have you noticed more of your body being more aware of what's going on in life or is it just all subconsciously? If, if that question makes sense. Mm. I think gut, what, what people call gut reactions um, are more often their personal truths than what they think or what they call some other type of of, uh, of thought because they're factoring in emotion right your gut is where you you feel as well as think so a gut a gut reaction or a gut feeling um factors that in whereas if it's not your gut and you use some other vernacular it tends to be up here and so you're not and again so if we're using chakra kind of language you're you're gut so your will your be maybe your third chakra or your heart would be your fourth and then you're up in your sixth for the intuition and for other things but if you haven't integrated them all say because you know maybe your your head thinks one thing and your heart says another the songs and stuff that say that or or your your gut is is a bit lower even than that and there's more instinctual feelings that you'll get that from um so I would always uh, run your intuitions down. So, you know, ooh, I wonder about that. And then I'll run it down through your heart and then down through your gut and see if it still resonates. Um, so I, I do think that's a helpful feature. And the reason that tends to be right, and it's subjective what right means, but it tends to be so because we're fully integrated when we make those decisions. If we're just basing it on something up here and not running it through the factory down here then it's not going to be a completed end product and it might not you know so be you're, fully. Able, you're able to process information that way like through through the chakras is, is that kind of what you're describing i wouldn't necessarily i don't i don't like visualize it in that sense but when i talked about how when i have traumatic events or negative things happen in my life i'll usually just lay down i might fall asleep and then when i wake up i'll continue thinking about the thing rather than doing some other thing i'm not going to do anything else i'll just sit there so like and the most the most traumatic thing and you don't have to describe what that is but like that instant feeling of that experience and how powerful that emotion is i think that that's insane that i mean a whole bunch of traumatic ex experiences in life would not be a good life in my opinion unless i mean maybe for some people it would be but i'm saying just like you, you don't really know that feeling until you have it. And then when you have it, you're like, oh, my God, this is such a powerful and overwhelming feeling. Mm. Well, some things, I mean, if it's like that, then you definitely want to go with it. If it's so powerful that you're just <laughs> astonished at how much you feel the thing, then I would definitely probably go <laughs> go with, the, with that. Um, but not everything is going to be that obvious. Not everything is going to have an overwhelming gut reaction to it. Some things are going to be very subtle. And that's why I'm saying you actually have to give yourself enough space to sit there with your thoughts and feelings and be feel them both think them you know be with them rather than distract yourself watch tv and think about them or scroll your phone and think about it, listen to music think about it. if you're doing anything else it's it's going to distract you from the reality of that that issue that you're meditating on let's say like um, meditation they talk about as like no thinking and then they also use the words meditate on and i i understand that i agree with that I think sometimes you should meditate on things as in think about them, but 
focused thinking and only thinking about that versus sporadic, random, whatever you want to be thinking about. Um, and I would say that that's actually the first step. You have to meditate on these important bubbles I was talking about that pop up before you could ever get to the space of not like meditating off. <laughs> you have to meditate on before you can meditate off. If, if it's overwhelming, then that's easy. You know, you probably feel it anyway. But I guess what I was just saying was then for regular things that aren't quite so traumatic, but they they send you off kilter enough that you shouldn't necessarily just go about your day and forget about it. Yeah, I would sit with it and not necessarily be like, okay, let's move this to my fourth chakra. I don't like all the spiritual language, really. Like even just chakras themselves are kind of cringy to me, but I do get it. I mean, they're, yeah, they don't exist in the sense of like, I can p point to it and there's a spinning wheel there. There's, there's a, it's an analogy, but there are, it's a great analogy, let's put it that way. There, there seems to be, I mean, there are actual endocrine glands and, and functions associated with each one. So it's not even like it's non-physical, but there's psychological aspects to each physical thing too. So you've got certain nerve ganglions here, and then they, that, that you call your gut feeling and all that. So it's a useful language for people who are into it. But then for people who aren't, in, that's the problem is like, if you're with somebody who understands it and we can say chakras and not be triggered, like it's cool. But then when you're you're around people that have no idea what a chakra is and and then you're talking about, oh, I felt something in my fourth chakra and I, uh, and those people will just look at you like, what the heck, like you're speaking an alien language and that you're crazy basically. Um, but it's really just about vernacular. If they had the same vernacular as you did, same experiences, they'd understand why it, it's more like a convenience. <laughs> Talking about certain things with chakra points is more like a convenient way of holistically talking about a certain function. So like, you know, your throat chakra, there's certain psychological, um, spiritual and emotional and relationship, you know, communication functions that are all locked into this idea of the fifth chakra existing here at your throat and, and what happens because of it. And if other people know that jargon, you can just say fifth chakra and, and all that. Same with astrology. It's like that, where you can just be like Virgo, Sun, Pisces, Moon or something. And somebody who knows about it is just like, oh, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. But then somebody who doesn't is just like, what the heck are these people talking about? It's crazy. But it's, it's only crazy because you haven't delved into it enough. If you delved into it, it's not even necessarily saying that the people using the vernacular are thinking that there's some spinning wheel, you know, inside my pituitary gland. We're not even saying that. We understand that it's an analogy, we, but it's a great analogy that we can skip a whole bunch of <laughs> spiritual lingo with a, an understanding about the certain things that way and bypass it. Um, I'm just making this whole spiel because I always feel this way when, when uh, if you're having like a a discussion with people who are already involved in a subject and know the jargon and um, people that aren't can't even relate to what you're talking about. Similar to how I went on the rant earlier with Christians and the soul trap subject. It's the same idea. It's like they're, they're I always feel like I have to reiterate myself because there's so many different types of people listening. Uh, you got people that totally on board and they question everything exactly as I'm questioning it. And then they're just like, yep, I get you. But then you, there's also people like on the very end of the spectrum where they think they already know the opposite thing from what I'm saying I'm skeptical of. And now how do I gain their ear? Like I, I want them to still listen to me. I, I, but then if I talk only in this this terminology, they just you just lose a certain sector of, of people. And so I, I I lost my main accent when I, <laughs> I yeah when I moved away and, and I tried to be more international sounding and enunciate my words so everyone understands me. And then as a writer, you want to do the same thing. You want to use descriptive language. And so there's all these great words you can use. But then if people don't know those words, then you're just you're saying you're saying words that people don't even understand. And so you just you remove yourself from the people you'd most like to communicate with and influence from your from your knowledge base. So you have to like, to be a effective communicator, you can't just fall into your jingoistic um, 
jar jargon that like if people that get all into their field, doctors or for instance, you're a doctor and then so you know the official names for all these things, all these long words, these Latin names and you talk in that lingo. Well, now only other doctors can follow your conversation if you speak that way. But you could speak in another way and say the same, convey the same information in a way that everyone listening could actually follow and, and get something out of it. Uh, I'm trying to do that with many things, many topics, and yoga being just one of them. And like I say, to me, chakras and those kind of language, it's like I agree with it, I use it. Um, I think it's a great analogy. But then at the same time, it's like every time somebody brings it up, I feel like I have to make a caveat like this and be like, yeah, but at the same time, it's kind of cringy and I don't really, you know, they don't actually exist. <laughs> uh, it's my black and white thing again. I, I yeah. always tend towards the middle road of everything because I feel like I'm quite empathetic and I can see both sides of, of things. And when you're seeing both sides of issues, it's, it's difficult to be like, OK, so I'm going to come down over here. No, you're always you're always walking this middle road, being empathic and seeing and feeling what people on both sides of the spectrum must feel and think and and when you do that process you never really go all the way to one side or the other <laughs> and so everybody hates you <laughs> which is what i experienced because you mentioned earlier that you're like a centrist and i think i'm kind of like that too but most people think i'm like the most extreme person on earth like eric dubé like that name is so divisive now and i stand for these these divisive things but and seemingly extreme viewpoints but really, like in my daily life and, and, and in my own subjectivity, I don't think I'm extreme. I feel like I'm very metered and central, <laughs> middle of the road kind of thinker, feeler, uh, be it politically, spiritually, you name it. Like I said, agnostic. I mean, what could be more middle of the road than agnostic? And I'm that way about most things. But it's, like I said, the funny thing you find out about trying to go the middle path is rather than being able to get along with everyone. No, you just piss everyone off. <laughs> Nobody really can can vibe with that unless they are also actively doing that exact same thing. Well, and just a testament to that. I mean, like for people who feel that way about you, those, those people, and, and I could be wrong, but I, I don't think that they probably won't listen to any of your videos. <laughs> and if they have, it was probably maybe one or two minutes and then they turn it off. So that one, they're not doing the due diligence of, of just not, I guess, not participating, but even giving you the time of day to understand what it is that you had to present. And I, I, we've kind of been on this spiritual journey for the first couple hours of the podcast. And, I, and obviously, like I've been telling people that I'm having you on my show, and there are some questions that some people did have about Flat Earth, obviously. So we'll eventually dive into that. But like, it, I think specifically, it was like one of the podcasts on the Joe Rogan, the dinosaur guy. And I remember just Joe and them, like the dinosaur guy, bringing up you and talking about how, you know, that dinosaurs never existed. And that guy was just so bent out of shape about you, so angry, so mad that, you know, like th that's kind of what you're describing, like how people get towards you. And, and, and it's like I think they did play some of the clip of the video that you presented on the on the Joe Rogan podcast. I don't specifically remember how long the clip was, but I don't know, man, it's just I give you I, I I admire the fact that you're able to take all that criticism, especially on a national stage, and just say, whatever, man, like, this is who I am, you know, take it for what it is. This is the evidence and the information I have and just take it. Right. And and I'm just skeptical. Like, the things I do is, like I say, I don't believe in things. That's all it is. Right. I don't believe in dinosaurs. I don't believe in nuclear weapons. I don't believe Jesus existed. Uh, you know, and when you say that, all the people that do believe in those things just get all bent out of shape. Which, and, by the way, by the way, you were you were the first person I heard about the like the nuclear weapons that they didn't exist. I remember that's when I first got started watching some of your videos, and and you had presented that. And I think it's funny now is what like a month or two ago, Joe Rogan had that guy on a show, and he showed a video to Joe of like the camera panned out, and it's just like they look like these fake fake little toy houses. And he's like, no, this is the actual video. This is the actual video of them saying that nuclear bomb was just launched. And Joe's like, wow. So these people are slowly coming around, man, to the conspiracy side because the evidence is right in front of us, in my mm -hmm. opinion. But I mean, like, you, you know how people get, especially, you know, again, this has been a very long time for me, but like seven years, and this was before I even was doing podcasts, and I started watching your content, and like, and, and I'm sure you, other, pod, other podcasts you've done, people are describing the same situation, but it's just like, 
when you bring this up to people, like they they have the same, my friends had the same reaction as Joe did, like in those podcasts. And like, it's almost like getting PTSD when I would watch Eddie and, and Joe go back and forth and Brian or whoever else the other guy was that, the, the you know, one of Joe's friends who's a big, like, he's a smart science guy or whatever. <laughs> And, like, my friends acted the same way that Joe and that other guy did. Like, they just get defensive. They don't want to hear about it. And, like, you can just see Joe's face in those moments where he's just like, shit, man. Like, whoever is in control of this podcast, like, the, in my opinion, you just see it on his face. Like, I mean, I need Eddie to shut up. Like, we can't talk about this. And that's how my friends would be. Like, Paul, you're crazy. You don't make any sense. There's no way that that's true. Um, but But I almost feel like it was right around that time, like, he had had Neil deGrasse Tyson on, like you described. And then shortly after that, he had Neil on the first time, you and Neil were supposed to have a debate. And that's just, it, it, it's a, it, it's weird that you're a part of that. And if that even matters, I don't know. But all of that kind of happened in the same time, the mm -hmm. same time frame. Because Joe has the biggest podcast in the world. And he's reaching hundreds of millions of people, I think, you know. And you were going to go on a show and in my opinion, shit on Neil deGrasse Tyson and just the exposure that that would have had would have been immense, you know, and it would have progressed humanity, I guess, if you want to put it that way, I guess, a little bit further. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. And the people trying to retard the progression of humanity would recognize that and be like, there's no benefit of having, you know, getting Eric Dubay on a platform like that against somebody that's perceived as such an authority on these matters as Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yeah, there's, there's zero benefit to them doing that. And that's why it seems to me the the way it worked out. It, you know, my channel got deleted at that time as well. Didn't you so, have a million, like a million subscribers or something crazy? Like, or it was close? No, no. no. I, I, well, I had many view, the I had millions of views on certain videos I, because earlier channels, back before the algorithm was the way it was, some of my videos were able to go organically viral. Now, no matter how good... <laughs> the content is that I put out, it only gets a certain level of virality, which is basically to be able to see, be seen by all my subscribers. That, that's as viral as, as a video of mine gets nowadays. Um, in a normal video, it seems like it's not, people aren't even uh, seeing them. Um, whereas before, I would get several videos would have way more views than I have subscribers. So, I mean, that's, that's a good measure for virality. Now, like I said, I don't get any videos that have more views than I have subscribers pretty much. So that's telling you that my video is not being recommended. It's not getting out there unless you're, <laughs> it gets recommended to my subscribers. If you haven't clicked the new video yet and you're on your homepage, yeah, it'll show up, but that's it. You so know, I know, I know on Twitter yeah. that, you know, Elon Musk or whatever, it it's allegedly it's free speech. Now I'd be curious on how he would push your content on Twitter. <laughs> I'm wondering too, because I've just been kicked off of Twitter. Really? Like two, two months now, and I'm wondering, is it intentional or what is the deal? Because uh, they're not getting back to me. I've contacted them over and over again. Just one day, uh, I went to log into my Twitter, and it said this, this um, like financial scam thing, I think, uh, changed it to it. So instead of me being at Eric Dubay right now, the account says at AAVE reward. Have a reward, whatever that is, and and I think it's some financial scammer type thing has hacked into my account and then taken it over. But on the surface, that's what it is. But it's been two months now, and I've been contacting Twitter over and over again. They've only gotten back to me once to be like to like ask me the same question I already gave them, and there, nothing's happening. I don't know what the deal is. Whether this is their way of kicking me off the platform and pretending like it's an accident or um, wow. or, or if this is a real hacked thing. I've never been hacked before, but that's what it looks like on there now. It's like somebody has just taken over my account. But how? Nobody, nobody's hacked anything else on mine. Nobody has got my passwords. So why, why mysteriously is my Twitter now been given to someone else? I don't have well, an answer for it either, but. You would be the, probably the first person. And again, I, Elon said he wants free speech and all of that jazz, but. If he were to get rid of anyone since he owns it, I think that you would probably be the first person that he gets rid of. Yep, and I'm going and, for now. <laughs> and, 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 the reason I, back. and the reason I say that, and this is like one of the like the points I bring up every time whenever I have flat earth conversations with my friends. And you know, because I have a couple of friends who are like just real big Tesla people, you know, and just whenever SpaceX and those launches and they're like they get hard for it and all those types of things. And I'm like, 
what I'm like, wa watch one of those videos every single time. I was like, any, any launch that you want to watch, I'm like, you will never see a continuous feed throughout that whole process. It doesn't exist. They always pan out. They always cut. I'm like, there's not one continuous feed of it entering space. I'm like, that, that's, that's all I need right there. That's it. Mm -hmm. Like, why can't I just get that? Yeah. Why am I being manipulated? Why is the feed of information that I'm receiving being so manipulated as to be indistinguishable from a Hollywood movie? Because it's got so many cuts and edits that there's no proof that it's not just a Hollywood movie in the sense of like, yeah, they send up rockets uh, and then after a few minutes that feed cuts out and you get nothing but CGI clear CGI until you get maybe to some destination and then you get some better CGI or or some uh, actual photographs but you know like the the new Indian moon landing nonsense that was you know, bad. <laughs> so bad <laughs> I mean some of the worst CGI ever and then all you get for their official footage is like these little like slides of a uh, rover coming off of a ramp onto some dirt okay I'm supposed to believe that this is 100% definitely happening on the moon because because it's on my TV as usual. <laughs> yeah. So uh, these are all questions that you've answered and like this is I didn't want to do this because I, you have a lot of information and knowledge to give out. But just for my base this and, and I, I I've been doing again, you know how long I've been doing this. It'll actually be 6 years in February. You're the, this is the first time that I've ever talked about this on this podcast. I I've mentioned it a few times when I had my buddies that used to be here. And we'd go back and forth and we'd have arguments and it never ended good, you know, but I, so I mentioned it a few times on the podcast, but I never specifically talked about this. So again, I have a thousand people that watch, so I just kind of want them to understand a little bit. But what do you think the ISS is? Mm. So there's the internal version of the ISS that we see. And most of that is just uh, like, like they did the movie Gravity, you know, that whole movie Gravity was filmed here on Earth. And the whole thing looks like it was in space with legitimate spaceships and you can see the globe Earth beneath them and outer space behind them and they're floating and it's very um, realistic. Well, most internal shots of the ISS are done that same way, either that or with uh, harnesses and wires. Outside shots are also done the same way they did in the movie, which is through dark pools and CGI. So you're just in a pool. water gear and that's what all the little bubbles are in space and then for the reality aspect of the ISS which is we see something passing overhead uh, and you can see it in a telescope um, but is it a floating spaceship going by 200 miles up at 17,000 miles per hour as they claim um, there's no evidence of that when I have uh, footage you can see of the ISS and it's very holographic looking and it doesn't really look uh, three dimensional. Um, it's, and it has kind of a rainbowy glittery effect similar to like a hologram card when you, when you tilt it. Um, uh, so to me, there's obviously something that they've got going by there like every hour and a half or something that you can clip a little picture of. But it seems to be way closer than 200 miles away <laughs> and seems to be going uh, slower than 17,000 miles per hour. And, uh, you know, things don't just there is no floaty spot of the atmosphere. That's the whole thing is people think that stuff can just go up there and it floats like that just doesn't happen. You believe in that again. I don't believe in that. Um, so I would say something is being projected. It might be a drone or whatnot. And uh, I tend to believe that even more so, or I, t I don't like that word believe, I tend to lean towards that even more so since Elon's Starlink thing came out, came out which appears to be uh, what, you know, military have this technology which is high altitude solar powered drones that can stay up without refueling for months. And it looks like just a string of those with lights on the bottom. And so I think that's what the Starlink satellites are, is just drones. Um, and the ISS, I think, is probably a prototype of that. It's probably another drone that either is shaped in that manner or it casts a hologram around it. Okay. Because it looks holographic, like when you turn on and off an old television, 
the color display, how that happens is exactly what you see when you're zooming in and out of the ISS. <laughs> gotcha. OK, so what about so this has always fascinated me just and I'm curious on what your thoughts are, but obviously you can buy a high powered telescope. I mean, everyone has access to it. I bought a P900, um, so I'm able to, I've done close moon shots, stuff like that. They're not in, too crazy, but I think for the price, like the P900, P1000s are great tools to have to help uh, help spread knowledge about flat Earth, honestly. I think that those what those are great for. But there are like five, ten thousand dollar telescopes you can buy and you can zoom in on, you know, and I don't know how well because I never owned one of those, but like you get on YouTube and people like show videos of Saturn and show videos of Jupiter and like they zoom in and you, and you can see like rotating moons, like kind of what are your thoughts on, on that whole type of thing? Well, the, certain the, the more expensive telescopes, they come with like digital overlays and color correction already mapped into it. So there's an aspect of these supposed amateur astronomers using their really big telescopes and getting images that look somewhere in between the overly produced, clearly CGI ones that uh, NASA gives us and way more um, apparent, say, than the, the images uh, people are getting from a P900 or something like that. But that's not because they are zooming in on it better and getting oftentimes those telescopes aren't any more zoom than the the cameras they have these overlays and so it's making it appear uh solid where when it's not or you know what i mean it's it's seeming like a solid structure and as far as the moons you're talking about moons so there's there's a light in the sky they they claim it's 3d that's the other thing so whether you're using a telescope or anything else you're only seeing one side of these things, whether it's the sun, the moon, stars. You can assume that there may be a, a dark side, a back side, and it may be three dimensional in shape. But you again, you don't know that. You can only believe or, or disbelieve. So I'm agnostic about the shape of these things as well. Is there a back side to them? We don't see them. So I'm not like it's not a foregone conclusion that Jupiter has a a back to it, and it's not just a disc light in that shape and if you see other smaller lights around it and they move that doesn't mean that there are spheres and then other smaller spheres and they're involved in this motion like like they claim the solar system works in it doesn't have to be like that they could be uh, two-dimensional lights as part of a firmament that rotates and if the um, those are called the wandering stars. They don't rotate in the same way the fixed stars do. They are revolving around a revolving object, the sun. So they have kind of like a spirograph pattern with retrograde motions at certain points in their, their path and everything. Um, so we, we can't, when we say something like, like Galileo, he used a 30 times zoom telescope, you know, compare that to your 125 zoom um, P900. <laughs> So I can we can zoom in on Jupiter's uh, moons at least four times better than Galileo could. And he's saying with his crappy telescope that he figured out that those are definitely four moons that revolve around Jupiter. And because they do that, that that is analogous to uh, the moon revolving around our globe Earth. And there's a new proof of the globe because he saw that. Now, I mean, it's the same as anything else. You see lights in the sky and then you try to apply it to what's beneath your feet, even if they are three-dimensional, even if those all are spheres and, and you could legitimately call those moons, they're satellites of that object and they only revolve around that object. Okay, so so there's a light, so the spherical lights up there revolving around each other. It still has nothing to do with what's down here. So, so even if you could prove it to that point, which they don't, they're only guessing that that's what's they're seeing because they're not because they're, they're just seeing they're not <laughs> they're not there to see around it. they're only seeing one side of it even so you're not even getting a full so with with the sun um i, I remember there was this old guy this was like probably 10 years ago his name was the old marine and he was a youtuber and what he did is he would you know he had a, a pretty good camera and he had like the the sun filter and he'd always zoom in on like sunspots and just like the sun uh and i can't remember so this have you seen video like that of, of the sun like rotating 
or is it only stationary and you just need like sunspots appear type of thing? I mean, the moon rotates this way. <laughs> right. It, it never shows you the dark side, but it does uh, rotate in 360 degrees inclination every day. But you'll mm -hmm. mostly see the same inclination because it's going 360 degrees around the Earth, over the Earth. Okay. And so um, there's that. And the sun, I think, is basically doing the same thing. So it's not revolving like the sunspots aren't go doing that. They're doing this. Um, and again, the sun, you can't tell if it's spherical or disc shaped. Uh, it looks, looks like a disc to me. Yeah. Um, but they propagate that it's a sphere. But I understand that I can't know for sure either way. So I don't 100% say it's a disc. It just seems to have those properties. Same with the moon. It, you know, there's this other tangential uh, evidence, like the fact that it's semi translucent and you can see stars through it and you can see the blue of the afternoon sky through a half disappeared moon and, and certain things like this that don't make it seem like your typical tangible 3D object. It's if it is 3D, it's pretty um, translucent and otherwise it may not even be physical in the, in that sense. It could be like plasma. It could be a different element or it could um, not even be physical. It could just be a light, you know, don't know. I'm open to these things, but that's the thing is when you say, <laughs> when you say, you know, one thing that everyone thinks is crazy, flat earth. And then you basically say, I don't know about every other question they ask you after that. They're like, what kind of a credible source are you? <laughs> you say you know this one thing that n nobody else um, agrees with, and then when we ask you anything about it, all you say is, I don't know. <laughs> it's like, yeah, because you, you've been, uh, you, be, meaning everyone else, has been fooled into thinking that all these tangential astronomical aspects have anything to do with the geography beneath your feet. And so there's all these straw man arguments that people have in their head about what's going on over their heads and they think that you now need to give them new answers for these things to be able to claim something new about what's under your feet but no all you're trying to say is guys <laughs> chill about all the stuff over your head that nasa keeps telling you about outer space and the planets all the, the moons and galileos and all it's like yeah what does that have to do with the earth under our feet right zero that's, that's why I like the iss you're asking me about all these things that's what they always do the globe <laughs> The globe religion, when you you know want to get to the bottom of it, rather than looking down at the supposed globe, they're like, no, 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 no. look up, look, yeah, look at that, look yeah, that. look over there. What about this though? What about that? Have you seen this? Do you see this? It's like, weren't we talking about that? I thought the whole point was you were asking me about the Earth. You're like, yeah, yeah, but, but, and the whole conversation every single time with every person, it ends up this way, and that's why right. I always, I'm getting real demonstrative because it always feels that way. Is like I'm trying to tell people about the Earth and they're they just go, yeah, but the sun and the moon. And, the, and it's like, these are all red herrings. That's and why I trying was... to bring people back to the subject at hand is almost impossible. Because every time you do, they think that you're avoiding it or that you don't know this thing or it's a, some gotcha. It's like, no, you didn't get me. It's irrelevant. <laughs> right. No, that's why, like, obviously, like, whenever I knew you were coming on the podcast, I was super excited. And it wasn't to even talk about Flat Earth, man, because I know you have so much more to offer. And that's why I feel like like the first two hours, man, we like we just hit spirituality, like what's here in front of us, what's on the ground. And, and I'm glad that we did it that way, man, because that, that just you're, you're right. We need to focus on what's here. But what's really cool about that is like even before like the censorship started and, and YouTube changed their terms of services, you had already made an impact. man. You'd already reached millions of people. You had well, you had you had poked the, the bear, per se. You know, and, and I think that that's super important that that happened. And I think that they were a little too late to the game. And thank God that they were, man, that you were able to to reach that many people before they started really censoring people and shadow banning and all those types of things. So I think that's really cool. And there's more people that are aware of it. I'd say it's probably more people of my age. I could be wrong. But anyone younger that, you know, when I go to work and I talk about flat earth, they're like, oh, God. You know, like the, the younger crowd, they're still in the indoctrination camps and all, all those types of things. But you've made, you've made a ripple effect, man, and that's huge. And, and if I could only do that, you know, I'd be happy with that as well. But that, that's just me. So um, I, I just had to just like just a couple more of those questions, then we can just, you know, end it however you want to. Um, but just kind of a, a more testament to like the telescope thing. They have these observatories with like 
you know, I don't know what, 10, 20, 30 million dollar telescopes, you know, and they can't put like a life, a life, a camera on that with a live stream and show us what they're looking at. Does mm -hmm. that exist? Does that, is that even a thing? Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> yeah. Why can't we see that? And why, why would the Hubble, why can't we see it with that or the, the web telescope that they claim is out there? And, and even more so, why can't they turn it around and show us this amazing technology and how it would work to zoom in on Earth? And on some upside down people in Australia, that would be all it would take is as simple as this technology that they supposedly have that's already out there, already broadcasting to them. So all they got to do is take their little remote control, turn that thing around, zoom in, turn on some live video on the news feeds and shut up every flat earther ever in yep. five seconds. You know, it's, it's that easy. There's so many ways that they could, you know, if the globe was real, if all these fantasies that they're creating for us were in any way factual, they, they could put it to rest. So I think it, I, it only exists because they can't do these things. They can't actually show demonstrable evidence of Earth being a globe. <clears throat> so my, one of my favorite videos that, that, that you have that kind of demonstrates what it is, is I don't know if it's a drone that goes up into the sky and then you fast forward and it's just like a plane just going for miles and miles and miles. My, my question is, why don't they do that in Antarctica? And why don't they show like a live stream of like a high powered drone, however much money that would cost? I don't know. There are people out there with an, an endless amount of money who want to prove that the Earth is round. Do that and have it circumnavigate the Earth north to south. Why yeah. hasn't that been done? We live yeah. in an age where that's inexcusable. Yes, you can live stream it. Yeah. It, it wouldn't be that difficult to, to set that up uh, you know, if that was <laughs> a reality. But of course, they, they just can't do it. And they're going to make excuse after excuse of why they can't do it um, till the cows come home, because it would expose them to even try to do these things. And that's why I put that challenge out there. How to shut up flat earthers forever is essentially to do that. Either, you know, live stream it, to, uh, let us go in planes, let us go in a straight line for 24 or 48 hours and see what happens. Or get rid of that Ant Antarctic treaty and allow independent exploration of Antarctica. Any of those things would end this deception overnight because we'd find whatever the truth is that I don't even know. But I know it's not what they're telling us it is, and they're never going to prove that it's that way by doing any of these tests because they can't do them. And if they did pretend to do them, I guarantee we'd find the flaw, as in, you know, they say they go in a straight line and they don't. They go in a circle or something like that. They would, they'd have to find a way to fake it if they did do such a thing. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, the ultimate, of course, is just let us do our own, you know, the easy way to fake it is to make a big event and be like, OK, the Flat Earthers asked for it. We're going to do the the thing. We're going to go over Antarctica and then they can fake it like right. they always do. And then and use their propaganda machine to make every, you know, they're going to fool some of the Flat Earthers maybe. And so even that, I don't necessarily like that idea as much as just get rid of that treaty. Why is there places on Earth that nobody you say nobody even lives there? And it's just snow and there's nothing there. Why can't we just take independent trips? You can you can maintain parts of the treaty, like, okay, you can't go dig for oil, no corporations can set up there, whatever. But independent exploration? If people just wanna be a Viking voyager, explore, you know, Truman wants to go to the edge of his map, why can't we do that? And there's no reason that resonates that anybody is saying as to why that doesn't happen. The only things they ever come up with is to preserve the integrity of Antarctica and we don't want people resource mining and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I'm not talking about that. Independent exploration. Just let explorers go explore. Why can't explorers go explore? Right. Come on. Yeah. And, and, and I know like they're going to say, well, it's for the safety and you might end up dying. Well, I mean, at that point, it, it's personal. It's up to them. Exactly. Yeah, you can't you can't save everybody from from offing themselves if they want to do that. They can do it anytime, any day. You can make it illegal, but it doesn't make it right and it doesn't make it uh, even feasible. People are still going to do it. So um, the the idea of like, well, we were doing this for your benefit. Yeah, thanks, government. You always use that as your excuse. You know, yeah. the, everything is for my benefit, but it always takes my freedom away. Well, how about just give me my freedom and then I'll be the decision maker on what's for my benefit or what's not. I don't need a faceless entity called the government to make decisions like that for me. And they do that more and more so to the point that we're living in a controlled reality and most of it is either controlled by the government uh, the media and or corporations and to be 
your own person without influence from these things is almost impossible. I mean, you can't even live, you know, you're taxed and you could try to go in the jungle or something and, and all of these mind fictions are still going to come after you like an avatar or something. They're going to, they're going to catch up with you eventually. So we're, we're involved in these anti-human human systems uh, because we've let them grow out of control. Oh yeah. Government's necessary, but it's not necessary in the sense of it evolves naturally out of human groupings. You interact in a group setting, politics gets involved. You know, you try to live together on a commune, you try to start a, a business, whatever, it becomes political. You, you, and there's a bureaucracy, there's a governing structure. These things are just eventualities. So again, not black and white, but they grow out of control to the point that now you don't have a world government. Well, that's the worst. I mean, that's there's the black of this black and white issue is if you have the biggest government possible, one that controls everything on Earth. I mean, no, the actual governance is, like I said, s small scales, groups of people making decisions that affect them together. That's real government. So this, I, this idea of representative government, when you start to have to elect somebody to go somewhere else, and then he speaks on the behalf of everyone in this area, how could he, even if he was the best representative possible, how can that system now be beneficial for all these people here? You've just outgrown the reality of the system. You've just made it bigger than it's able to be. And that's what government's doing over and over. It keeps eating it, um, keeps, you know, it starts at a local level like it should, and there should never be anything above that. Then you get the state level, and then the federal level, and then and then we want the world level. The UN's going to come eat everything, and it's like, no, let's go back to community level because that if the second you get into the forms of representative government where someone else has to represent you, and you no longer have your own voice, and your vote is no longer your vote, it's for somebody else to then vote for you. No, you've just grown the government out of any kind of benefit it could have for society. And that's where we're at today. And we keep growing it. Yeah. And, so, and, and eating the smaller ones. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, throughout this process, man, I met like a lot of great people, and especially locally. Um, and it was through YouTube just a couple of years ago. I met a guy named Pat Holland. And come to find out, you know, I, I met him through an, a, another YouTuber, and I, I, I came across him. So come to find out, he lives three hours south of me. His name's Pat Holland. Super good guy. He had a podcast on YouTube called the Truth, Money, Freedom podcast. And, you know, as time grew on and stuff like that, you know, he was, you know, in this movement that you and I are in it, you know, and he started a, a, the Missouri Freedom Initiative. So it's a grassroots movement here in Missouri where, you know, him and, you know, a couple, a couple hundred people that are involved, it could be thousands now, actually got legislation passed in Missouri a couple of years ago called the, uh, the Second Amendment Preservation Act. And these are just civilians, Eric. Like Pat's a civilian. There's some other people that are involved that are civilians. They go down to the to, to the capital of Missouri, you know, whenever whenever it's in session for a couple months, and they literally, as civilians, got this legislation passed. And Missouri is the freest gun state in all 50 states because of this grassroots organization. And I completely agree with you. It's a testament of what we forget we have as civilians. And it's almost like, I wouldn't say an obligation, but a duty to be a part of that process to make sure that government doesn't grow and fester. Because throughout that, throughout the process of the Missouri Freedom Initiative, Pat, if you're listening, man, uh, I greatly appreciate you and your movement, um, is this past year in legislation, they were trying to get other things passed. And there's the Speaker of the House, uh, Dean Plocker here in Missouri, um, is a rhino, and he's stonewalling these people, Pat and his people, you know? gaslighting whenever they're trying to get up and they're trying to get legislation passed that's important for people in missouri like getting rid of personal property tax getting rid of sales tax on food these were things that they were trying to get passed in missouri this year dean plocker rhino who's on the right said no no basically i'm the speaker of the house we're going to stonewall do all these types of things well through investigation and through the firm that he works for they found out that there is some money being funneled into the firm that he works for from the world economic forum mm. So it's just weird, you know, like you said, like all these big moving parts and big corporations, they have their hands in everything, Eric, even in local politics on the lowest level to where the Speaker of the House in Missouri is affecting legislation being passed for 4 million people. Mm -hmm. 
so that that's just kind of where we're at, man. I completely agree with the grassroots movement and and th those types of things, but more people have to want it and more people have to get involved. Right. Yeah. Like I said, when people start having representative government and then those representatives start rubbing elbows with other representatives and these lobbyists and these other people that are exclusive to that inner circle of controllers, because that's essentially what they are, well, they're going to start making concessions for certain advantages, personal advantages that they can receive. And uh, no matter how good your integrity is, you have to balance those two worlds. You know, even if you wanted to be completely for the people you're representing and uh, every lobbyist, every person you're rubbing elbows with, you're going to try and maintain your integrity. Well, you're still involved in it. It's it's going to wear at you just to try and maintain that integrity in such an environment. And that's what, you know, is, is the main issue with politics. You find all these people make these promises and then they all go back on them. Is it because they never intended to do it in the first place? Or is it because when you get into that position, you find that it's not as easy as just being able to do everything you think that you want to be able to do? There's all these outside influences that have much more power than you or the, the world perceives. I think uh, presidents, you know, they seem to be figureheads more so than actual controllers, and they may be deluded um, just as much as um, the public into the process that's actually happening there and how much control they're going to have once they gain the authority of being the president or whatever these uh, positions of power be, even a senator or a congressman or whatever, how much autonomy do they actually have once they're in those positions of power? Are they truly just making their own independent decisions or are there so many bugs in their ear left and right and people trying to push them and sway them this way and that, that uh, that's pretty skewed and it would be difficult even for them to elucidate all their influences and why they made ultimately the decisions that they make. Um, and, and I'm being generous. A lot of them, it's, it's obvious they're just getting money. You know, people are just paying them a shitload of money and then, yeah, OK, fine, sell out. Um, that's often what it is. I'm just saying there's there's nuance to it that some people that don't want to so easily sell out probably still will in some aspects just because of the nature of the beast. Which is again why I've said I don't even want to get involved in it. I think it's already grown out of proportion to the point that politics in its current state is, um, you know, the, the only thing that we could do is, like you're saying, at a local level, absolutely start your own initiatives, um, do things that you can do um, at a community level, because that's not that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this representative government, voting for presidents and voting for other people to vote for other things for you. Um, if you're talking about enacting legislation that's important to you, like maintaining your Second Amendment rights, absolutely, that's exactly the kind of political action that we should be taking, rather than just watching political debates and then waiting for, um, you know, every four years to put in a, a ballot. That level of political responsibility is base. It's so nothing. You're basically doing nothing. You're basically assenting, giving consent to a system that doesn't even deserve your vote. You're better off not voting and finding any other tangential political thing like you're saying Pat Holland has done uh, to enact you know, actual grassroots local legislation that affects you in your area rather than just railing against you know, the president of a, of a huge country that you'll never see or talk to and uh, have any actual influence over, but you you act as if you know the people get so into um, their presidents that they select or the president that they didn't select, and it's like it's this end all be all that my guy got in and he's doing the best job ever, or ever since he's been out, it's just been hell. It's been terrible. And again, black and white, they're just they can't just yeah. It's, to me, whether it was Trump or Biden or anyone else, it's still shades of the same gray system and nobody's doing wonderfully. They're all politicians playing pl playing us for fools, stealing our tax money, um, giving consent to a system that I think uh, should be relegated to the dustbin. We should all um, get back to smaller community governments and volunteerism, not forced governance and larger and larger governments like the UN 
and the WEF and all these huge organizations are trying to push us into bigger and bigger groupings. Yeah, it's uh, give them bread and circus. I think that's one of the greatest quotes that'll stand, you know, that, that'll test the tale of time. You know, it's just, it's the truest thing when it's and the same with politics as it is with sports, man. Like people, they love their team. Again, that was another uh, addiction of mine, was just being the biggest Chiefs fan, you know, my whole life since I was five. It was just something my dad and I always did. Every Sunday, man, we're watching this football game. And then again, like I'm, I'm getting to this age and I'm not saying I'll never watch Chiefs football again, Eric. But what I'm saying is, man, like I'm, I'm starting to realize I'm like, why am I watching grown men throw a football around making millions of dollars? And it's not benefiting me in any way except negatively if they lose. And they, you know, I'm just like, what am I doing here, man? And it's the same with politics. Like you like you just described, it's just give them bread and circus. And it, it's just time to move on from that in my life anyways. But I guess you, you kind of already answered my question just at the latter part right there is, I guess I, I got a two part question at the core of what the Constitution is. Do you find it to be beneficial for a, a, a large society of allegedly in which, by the way, I loved your uh, overpopulation eight minute video you did the other day. I thought that was fantastic. And I kind of wanted to get into that. But I'm like, man, he just did a recent video. So all your people know that. Um, but do, at the core, do you think the Constitution is like, I guess, workable for a society this large? And if not, and, you, and again, this is what you already answered, what do you kind of think the answer is? And I'll let you re-answer that again, sorry. Yeah, no, I think the American Constitution is a great document, um, a good attempt at lining out a minarchist government. And it seems like we just failed the test or something because we're not doing what it said that we're supposed to do. We're, the, the First Amendment is we're all supposed to have freedom of speech. How, how much do you feel like you have freedom of speech in America anymore? <laughs> you know, the Second Amendment is the freedom to bear arms. And that's slowly being eroded, uh, like you said, in most places, maybe not so much in Missouri. But um, we're not living in accordance with the document. And I would say, again, local smaller governments is what you want. And if you're at that level, everybody can connect in a village gathering at a community hall and make political decisions that way. So there's there's no real need for overarching systems or even a rule book that everybody has to follow because you can, you can change with the times. You don't have to set something in stone that way, uh, like a constitution. Um, but yeah, if you're gonna try to govern a large area, geographical area and large numbers of population and do it by just having you know, a House of Representatives, uh, senators, and a, a president. I mean, it's very few people for such a huge endeavor. And I think it's kind of destined to fail because you're trying to overreach what that could possibly do. If smaller communities had their own individual constitutions, and you could say, use that as a basis, and then there is no federal government to come in and override whatever the states decide for themselves, or even more so smaller communities, because even the state's pretty, pretty large. Um, and if the ultimate authority was the local community government, and then the state or federal were just more like suggestions, and you might, you might get uh, benefits or whatever from opting into their things, but ultimately having the freedom not to, that's what I'm advocating is true voluntarism and smaller government. And so that's how it would play out is that we would get more involved in local community government. And at first, we would, I assume we just have to be disobeying the larger governments. You'd have to create your own er areas, your own communes. They'd call them cults or something. They'd come out with words, compound. They'll come out with words for what we, whatever we decide to do. But as people start breaking off, finding like-minded people, their tribe, so to speak, and then growing communities organically um, with their tribe. Yeah, what do you bet? These middlemen are going to come in trying to get their cut. They're going to try to get you to conform to their version of society. They're going to say, that's a, a natural reserve. You can't build there. Oh, you need to pay taxes for that. You can't do this. You can't do that. And this is it. We either have to start making the concessions or you have to be a complete rebel. And either way, it's not easy. And it's um, the outcome's not guaranteed. And so that's kind of where we're at, where it's like people would like to obviously start doing these kind of things, uh, branch out, create our own communities and all that. 
But if we, do, it's like if we don't all agree on this and all do it at the same time, well, they're just going to smash us one at a time. Every little community that tries to do its own thing and think that its laws and its, you know, mandates are superior to state and federal mandate. <laughs> Oh, oh, you think so? And then they'll come in with their authority and their troops and their, their actual power and show you what a little, you know, influence you actually have and how you actually are totally controlled. Similar to, I think, that was Frank Zappa quote where he talks about how, like, the military industrial complex is, it's like this brick wall that's right there behind the stage and you can never get past it and it will, you will smash your head up against it eventually. But... In front of that, you got the stage and you got the curtains and you got the, the actors and they're all, oh, vote for me. Oh, we're going to go get those guys. Oh, we'll protect you from this and all that. And you're deluded by this facade of protection and security. But behind it is this force of the military. The, the guy, you know, like the Wizard of Oz thing. And most people do, they're placated by that. And the few of us that see through it and see to the brick wall, you know, this is, again, this is why I'm saying like, spreading the truth is pretty much the most important thing we can do right now. Because even if you try to take action right now, you're just gonna get smashed like the little bug you are. Whereas if you instead, Get, spread the message out there. So every, we, what we need is humanity to like level up. That's what's happened is humanity has our consciousness, our psychology and our emotional our, our IQs and our EQs have just been depressed to the point that we're not operating on a very high vibration or wavelength when it comes to making, making good decisions or, or what have you. So when you look at the government, it's easy to project on, oh, the politician did this and the government's bad. Yeah, but all these people are just people, too. And they're just, they're a reflection of how far humanity has fallen. And you can blame the system. Or see that the system itself <laughs> is a response to fallen humanity. If humanity wasn't as fallen, we probably wouldn't be operating in this system. And if we weren't operating in this system, it wouldn't recruit new members the way it does. And it's this circular, self-fulfilling prophecy where the only way anyone will ever get out of it is, again, bringing it back to this self-actualization, self-development. You actually have to spiritually evolve humanity if we want to see better results in government than we're seeing right now. If humanity so itself doesn't spiritually evolve beyond where we are now, how could we possibly have representatives that are any better than the representatives we have now? They're just, they're a pool of what humanity has to offer right now. If we upgrade the pool, then we'll upgrade them. And we'll upgrade the system to the point that they're not even in power anymore. <laughs> because we'll all have upgraded to the point that everyone will understand what I'm saying. And you wouldn't give your power away to representative and bigger and bigger forms of government that are farther and farther removed from you and your actual life in your local community. But so I, I guess two parts to that would be one, I, and it, they'll, they'll tie it together. So with hierarchy, is it something that's always going to exist in human beings? And, and I think I asked this a little bit earlier in the podcast, but like when you talk about um, like spiritual individuality and, and just being collective that way, that way we can make better decisions, have better people helping us guide us into a better place. Throughout your research, have you found a time a, a time period on Earth where that has been the case, or is hierarchy always existed and it's just always been this time loop that's just continuously happening, where hi hierarchy takes over self ind individuality? I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, hierarchy in the sense of we're all different and we are all at different levels on different things, uh, abilities, traits. Um, psychological development, things like this. So I would say hierarchy is innate in the human condition and nature anyway. So I don't think there's ever been a time when hierarchy didn't exist. Um, you know, like it's similar to the judgment thing where I was like, people like to pretend like they don't judge or you shouldn't judge. But in reality, you're just judging all the time. I think it's pretty much the same with hierarchy. You, it's It's a nice idea to pretend like everybody's equal and we're all the same and there shouldn't be 
um, hierarchy, but that's kind of like try not to judge or something because in reality, yeah, you can, there's hierarchies. There's things that are more this than that or less this than, than the other and it's naturally going to happen that way. So I wouldn't expect that there was ever a time when humanity was so average that nobody ever <laughs> became above or below that average. Um, so I think hierarchy is fine, necessary, always there and not an issue. The, the only problem with hierarchy is when the people that are perceived on the high end of the spectrum start having control or, you know, inflicting punishments or something on people that are just lower on that spectrum just because they happen to be lower. It doesn't mean they deserve um, less con autonomy or control of their own lives or uh, that kind of thing. So uh, there's nuance to that. I don't, I don't think there's any time when hierarchy didn't exist, but I do think that hierarchies can be abused. Fair enough. And so, again, through your research, have you found a period of time where maybe, because you've done a lot of research on like ancient cultures, right? Or, or is it more religion and maps than like ancient cultures? Both, yeah. Okay, so like, has there been a time where like the, the, the human consciousness level as a society or as a population was higher than it was right now? And, and I know the answer to that is most likely yes. But if so, I'm just kind of curious at, at what level was it? And, and I don't know, is there like different tiers of levels? What happens? And I'm not saying that you have the answers to all these questions. I'm just curious. Um, how far can we go, I guess, with that? Absolutely. I mean, that's the kind of things I wonder about as well. Um, I think it's pretty apparent that previous cultures, especially the further back you go even, um, the more advanced they were. And it's, so again, it's pretty much the opposite of what we are taught, where it's like the further back you go, you get to cavemen living in caves. They don't even know how to use fire and beaten, beaten things with clubs and whatever. I don't really think that that was, I mean, if there was any type of progression of humanity, I think it's more cyclical than this straight arrow that they try to <laughs> claim happens from a big bang all the way through smaller species up to humans and then humans up to superhuman, which is what they act like we are right now. But we're not very superhuman right now. We we seem more devolved than when you look at ancient cultures and their um, traditions and their spirituality and the things that um, they left for us that we can't even recreate today, like the pyramids and certain sculptures and architecture. It speaks to the fact that this idea that we've just, just recently um, come into our own technologically speaking is just not the case um, which is why I wonder things like we were saying earlier about like cell phones and computers and stuff did, did those really just recently come into history or were those potentially suppressed at some point and but they were known about before and they just kind of reintroduced it kind of like the airplane so they reintroduce the idea of flight through the Wright brothers, but are you telling me that never before in history had anyone ever figured out a way to travel using air? I mean, it's as easy as filling up a balloon and hanging on to it. <laughs> I think that Zeppelin technology used to be way more prevalent and advanced than history tells us. I think the Hindenburg event very well may have either been planned or if not planned, it was used to demonize a method of travel that is way better than, <laughs> than what we're using now instead of it. Um, I, I really wonder if that, you know, like the, the, the steampunk kind of fantasy settings that often existed in kind of like a 19th century um, uh, factory setting. Like, I wonder how real that may have been to be honest like you look at those world fairs like uh howdy Mikowski was presenting you look at some of the technology that they have they have like people movers way back like 100 years ago they're like what would you call those um treadmills long treadmills and they they have um uh, monorails setting and they, these these cities that they allegedly built and then tore down right afterwards they're greater than any actual city that still exists now. Whether whether they whether they just built it for the the World Fair like they claim, or whether they tore down an actual amazing structure, 
either way, we're not building those things back up now. So wh what was that? Um, and when you and when you tell us we're the most evolved ever, and we try to to back that with evidence, like I'm just not seeing it. The the more you look into ancient cultures, ancient architecture, ancient spirituality, it trumps anything we're doing now. And to act like like it's the opposite is pretty pretentious and egoistic. I think everyone wants to think that they're so in the know that, oh, that's similar to what we were saying earlier about like the globe religion or the Christian religion or any anything that is religious. Any anytime you boost a belief into a knowledge. You're on shaky ground and everyone around you is going to seem lower than you. You know, once you think you know that the earth is a globe and your friend starts questioning whether it's flat, suddenly you you now you didn't even know it beforehand. You have this huge ego. You have this huge ego around this subject that your friend just exposed. But of course, since it's your ego, you're probably not even going to notice it. He's going to notice it. He's going to get the brunt of your out of control ego that you don't even realize you have because you're believing in something you don't know. I really think that's a big issue where, where ego stems from is when people they they claim to have a knowledge claim for something that they don't actually know. They don't actually have a preponderance of evidence that they can present to somebody else so that that other person can also know the thing that they think they know. If you did, and that's simple. That's like I'm trying to do with the flat earth here. I got 200 proofs. Here you go. And then most rational people are like, holy shit, you're right. And they drop their ego and they're like, the earth is flat. I've been lied to my whole life. But then other people, they find out that they've got this huge ego in them and that they can't drop long enough to even listen to someone who has an alternative viewpoint from what they know to be true. And that's the thing. It's this. this that's why I'm harping on this distinction between knowledge and belief to the point that a lot of these knowers are unsubscribing because <laughs> they, yeah, can't, they can't handle the fact that I won't believe the thing that they know. Um, and, and I'm it. And they don't want to make that concession. They don't want to concede that they only believe the thing they think they know. And you'll lose a lot of friends, whether it's globe friends or religious, you know, other, otherwise, it's this religious thinking. It's this non agnostic thinking, this inability to just accept that you're confused and you're living in a mysterious condition here where you don't have clear cut answers. Just exist in the mystery. People don't want to do that. They want to have the answers and they want to, you know, it's a it's a nice feeling. You 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 um you don't have to be confused and you get to be an authority figure. So you get to tell people what's what. So it's enticing to be religious in that way that so many people, so many of your friends and family are. But it doesn't get exposed until you challenge it in this way. They just seem like normal people <laughs> until you find these little holes in their logic and then you realize that, oh, they've developed some psychological defense mechanisms that are not advantageous and that are preventing them from seeing truth because they believe in falsehoods.